Hi, everyone. Welcome to the 2020 Charlotte Reproductive Action Network Candidate Forum. Um, my name is Sarah Haley. I am the Executive Director of the Charlotte Reproductive Action Network, and I am really excited for tonight's event. Uh, we have 23 local candidates, which will be joining us um, to talk about issues um, affecting our communities around reproductive justice. Um, we are also going to get started by introducing our co-hosts for tonight. Um, I will be one of the co-hosts, and I'll be joined by two other amazing community leaders that we partner with um, here in Charlotte. Um, and we're going to talk a little bit about a couple events that we have coming up, and then we are going to dive right into our schedule. Um, we have a packed schedule tonight. Um, we have um, local judges. We have um, county commissioners. Uh, we have uh, North Carolina State House seats, North Carolina State Senate. So we have a lot of people joining us tonight. And so we're just going to dive in and get started right away. Um, so I'm going to first pass it over to um, Christina with the North Carolina AIDS Action Network um, to introduce herself and talk about um, an event that we have coming up tomorrow. Good evening, everyone. My name is Christina Adelike. I use she, her pronouns. I'm the policy and communications manager at the North Carolina AIDS Action Network. The North Carolina AIDS Action Network is a nonprofit that works to do advocacy and lobbying for HIV and AIDS issues in North Carolina. Um, we are partnering with CRAN actually this Thursday, tomorrow, oh wow, tomorrow, um, at 5.30 for a phone bank. And we'll also be partnering, partnering with Planned Parenthood for this event. Um, we'll be doing a phone bank to help raise awareness around the Supreme Court confirmation and its impact on reproductive rights, health care, and a lot of other issues that uh, we all hold so dear. So we're going to spend that evening encouraging our, our friends to be um, calling our senators, both Burr and Tillis, uh, to be able to stop this confirmation process. So if you're free, if you have other friends who are interested, please feel free to join us. We'll be sure to include the, the link in the chat box um, later on. Um, but I'll go ahead and pass it off to Taylor. Hi, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us tonight. Um, my name is Taylor Pinkney. Um, my pronouns are she, her, and hers. I work as the Black Organizing Program Specialist with Planned Parenthood South Atlantic, um, and I'm based in Charlotte, North Carolina. Um, we are, uh, Planned Parenthood South Atlantic is an affiliate of uh, Planned Parenthood Federation of America, but we are based in um, North Carolina, South Carolina, um, West Virginia, and the Rocky Mountains of Virginia. And um, as a part of CRAN, I am the head of the steering, a head of community education on our steering committee. Um, another event that we have, um, CRAN has coming up that you all can join us for, um, which is also posted on our Facebook page, is a um, documentary screening that is taking place next Tuesday, October 6th at 6 p.m. Um, CRAN is partnering with Sister Song, the ACLU of North Carolina, as well for a screening of um, Belly of the Bees. Um, this talk back will be moderated by Charmaine Lang of Sister Song, and uh, panel participants will include um, Christy Puckett, um, Williams of the ACLU, um, of North Carolina. And this film will just discuss um, a reproductive issue um, that is taking place in a California women's prison and is really timely discussion and we hope that you all can join us for that. Thank you and I will pass it back to Sarah. Great, thank you Taylor. Um, so we are gonna get started here in just a couple of minutes, um, but first I wanna spend some time talking about the mission of the Charlotte Reproductive Action Network. Um, we've been around for a little over two years now and our mission is really to connect and align the groups that are working on reproductive rights, reproductive health, and uh, reproductive justice here in Charlotte. Because um, we believe that when we work together, when we bridge the gaps, and we really combine efforts, we can make a larger impact here in Charlotte. Um, so we have over 24 different organizations that are part of our network, and we participate in events together. We um, host educational webinars, we host candidate forums like you're seeing today. Um, we also have a website uh, where we provide uh, local resources to individuals that are looking um, for help and access in reproductive health care. 
Um, this includes abortion care, but it also includes uh, prenatal and postnatal care as well, because we recognize that you can't fight for access to abortion without, without also fighting for the right to have a healthy child and to raise that child in a healthy environment. Um, so we take a holistic approach to um, reproductive justice and reproductive health care. Um, we also offer a community support program where we offer transportation and childcare um, and also full spectrum doula services to individuals who are seeking reproductive health care at no cost to the individual. Um, so you can go to our website. Um, it's www.charlottereproductiveactionnetwork.com and you can find out more information about some of our upcoming events as Taylor and Christina just went over. Um, you can also meet all of our partners and learn about all of the great work that they're doing and then also find out about some other events and other ways that you can get involved um, with the network. So with that, um, we're gonna go ahead and get started um, and we're gonna bring our first candidate. So I'm gonna pass it to um, Christina to introduce our first candidate. Thank you, Sarah. All right, we're gonna kick off with our judges and we'll be starting off with Judge John Rex Marvel running for District Judge in District 26. I'll go ahead and get started with you with our first question. What do you think is the role of a judge in protecting and expanding reproductive freedom? Thank you so much, uh, Christina, and thank you, uh, Cram. This is such an awesome group of advocates um, here in Charlotte, and, and um, I thank you for the opportunity. Um, I'll just preface it by, um, I, I work in um, domestic court and district court, and district court is uh, often referred to as, you know, the people's court, and that's because we're really the first tier on the process. You know, a lot of the other judges that are here uh, are the appellate court judges, and they're the ones that make um, the legal determinations or, you know, really interpret the law in a way that can make a uh, long-standing impact um, for, for changes like, like issues like uh, Roe v. Wade. Um, as a district court judge, um, I, I impact people's lives every day. Uh, I hear cases of domestic violence, emergency custody, um, issues that really impact uh, women and children every single day. And so what, what, the way I see my role impacting people's lives and uh, particularly um, concerning reproductive health is to always make sure that my courtroom is a safe place, an open place, a respectful place a place where everyone gets an opportunity to be heard, that everyone's treated fairly. And, um, you know, and I'll, I'll just give a, an example of what we've been able to do through COVID. Despite the limitations that we've had, we've really opened the operations of the court and expanded using new technologies just to make sure that we're still answering the needs of people in our community. Um, so we're able to address the issues of emergency custody and domestic violence every day. And as I was talking, uh, to uh, Sarah earlier before before we came on, you know, I, I have court from my house some days, you know, and I have remote court where I'm able to address the needs of families uh, or, or, or women or children uh, from their own home for their phone. I even receive phone calls from magistrates about domestic violence issues on, on an almost daily basis. So, so that's, that's what I think my role is. And I know it's a little different with, 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 the, with district court, um, but, you know, just providing a safe place uh, and an access to court is, is, I think, the best thing that we can do in district court. Absolutely. Absolutely. I think that's so, so important. Are we good on time? Mm -hmm. We are? All right. A question did come in on Facebook. Maybe we can sneak okay. it in. Um, and of course, you know, you're not responsible for this, but what is being done about the appointment to the Supreme Court and the potential threat to Roe v. Wade? So maybe you can share your just general thoughts on, on the mm. process and um, the impact you think it could have on, on people here in Mecklenburg County and certain communi communities. Yeah, well, obviously, I mean, this is, this is a, a huge deal. Uh, you know, I, I've never seen a judicial or a Supreme Court appointment be that fast tracked. I mean, frankly, Ruth Bader Ginsburg, who is loved and admired and, and was going to go down in history as, as one of the most beloved justices that has ever been on the Supreme Court. I mean, she, she hadn't even been buried at the point that they had announced that they were going to fill the seat and announce the person that they were going to. 
Um, you know, you know I, I've never seen anything like this. We're voting right now and they're pushing through the appointment. It's, um, you know, and again, judges are supposed to stay out of the political realm, but I can, I can tell you this is, this is unprecedented. What we're seeing is unprecedented. Um, I, I have no impact on what's happening. I've, I've heard certainly uh, conversations about what, uh, you know, the Senate is trying to do or, or, or uh, Democratic senators are trying to do to stop the process. And I've also heard about bills, you know, one bill that could limit uh, potentially the, uh, the lifetime appointment to an 18 years so judges are no longer appointed for life. Uh, the other bill would um, would be able to expand the court and the number of justices uh, because that isn't particularly defined. You know, we we technically could have a court of of 15 judges. You know, there's you know that that's that's really up to <laughs> the elected officials if they if they wanted to do that. So that's that's what is happening from from my view. Awesome! Thank you so much for sharing this evening. We really appreciate you joining us. Thank you for the invitation. Thank you so much. Thanks. I'm gonna go ahead and pass it off to Taylor. Okay, um, next we will have um, Judge Laura Kobich, who is running, a, who is a Democratic judge running for the NC Court of Appeals. Um, thank you for joining us. Um, good, at, well, good evening and, and to everyone and thanks for having us tonight. Um, as Taylor said, I am Superior Court Judge Laura Kobich. I am running for the North Carolina Court of Appeals for seat number five. Um, I, have, I graduated from North Carolina A&T and I went to UNC Chapel Hill to get my law degree. I have served in the legal positions of assistant district attorney, assistant attorney general, district court judge, and superior court judge. And all of those positions um, have placed me, put me in a position to be able to practice civil as well as criminal law, even appellate law, to be able to preside over every uh, misdemeanor and felony in our state and to be able to preside over all civil cases and issues that come before the court. I've also been appointed by the Chief Justice of the Supreme Court to handle what we call 2.1 matters, as well as handle matters where an action of the legislative branch has been challenged. So all of that prepares me for uh, the North Carolina Court of Appeals. And in my opinion, makes me uh, the qualified candidate to be able to transition to the Court of Appeals from my superior court seat. And, and I'm glad to be here. <laughs> oh, thank you. I'm sorry to interrupt, but I did have to just ask you the one question of what do you think is the um, most important role of a judge in protecting and expanding reproductive freedom? So that's my only question for you. So if you are able to answer that as well in that um, time, that would be great. But thank you. I think the most important um, thing that a judge needs to do if, if a challenge like that comes before the court is to review all of the evidence put before it, review it with a thorough legal analysis, and then make um, an independent decision, not leaning toward one way or another, not, not promoting anyone's agenda. And as an independent jurist, that's what I would do. Mm, thank you so much. Um, we appreciate you for joining us. And now I will pass it um, to Sarah, who will introduce our next speaker. Great. Thank you so much, Taylor. Um, so our next speaker is Judge Trisha Shields, who is a Democrat who is running for a seat on the North Carolina Court of Appeals. Thank you so much. I appreciate the opportunity um, to be here with you all today. My name is Tricia Shields. And one thing I want to make clear, the, the folks that you're seeing on the call tonight, we're not running against each other. There will be five seats from the Court of Appeals on your ballot. I'm running for seat four. Judge Cubbage is running for seat five. And, and my other friends here will explain to you what seats that they're running for. So I have practiced law here in North Carolina for 35 years. I have had a broad both trial and appellate experience. I began my um, career working at the Court of Appeals for Chief Judge Hedrick, and that formed the basis of, of my practice ever since. And what I learned there is how incredibly important judicial independence is, to follow up on something that Judge Cubbage mentioned a minute ago. And as you all know, we can't comment on cases that might come before us, but I wanna follow up a little bit on what um, Judge Marvel mentioned. One thing to remember, if you, things change at the federal level and we all know what the agenda is there, right? And whether that will be successful or not, we will see, but we know what the agenda is. 
What you need to remember is we have our very own constitution here in North Carolina. And what is important is to put people on the bench that understand what the constitution is, understand what it means. Again, I'm not saying how I would rule in any particular um, circumstance, but we, we need to have the people with the strength and the courage to apply the constitution to the cases that come before them. I am running, as Judge Kovic just mentioned, to be an independent judge. I am not coming to this with any political agenda. I will tell you that is not true of my opponent who is running to be a conservative judge, a constitutional conservative. So I leave that for you all um, to think about and to consider. But I would very much appreciate your support. I, like I said, I've been doing this for 35 years, a strong appellate practice. Uh, other lawyers hire me for, for, to help them on their appeals. This is really, frankly, where my whole career has been leading. And I am super, super excited to have this opportunity. Great, thank you so much. We're excited to have you. So I have um, the same question for you. Um, so what do you think is the role of a judge in protecting and expanding reproductive freedom? The role of a judge is to apply the constitution. That's the role. The role of the judge, what the, these, these issues have constitutional implications. And so like I said before, we cannot say um, how we would rule. In fact, anyone that did would um, be at risk for people asking for them to recuse themselves. For them. And so none bing, of us say how we would roll. Um, but, it, but it is important that judges apply the Constitution, understand it and apply it. Great. Thank you so much for being here tonight. Um, and thank you for running. Um, so I'm going to pass it over to uh, Christina for our next candidate. Thanks, Sarah. I'm going to go ahead and introduce Judge Gray Stiers. He's also running for judge. Hi, Gray. Nice to for you to join us. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm running for seat number six on the Court of Appeals. I'm the Democratic nominee for that seat, and I appreciate this opportunity to talk with you this evening. Uh, I grew up outside of Hickory, North Carolina. I did my undergraduate at Wake Forest and received my law degree from UNC Chapel Hill. After graduating uh, with my law degree, I worked for Chief Judge Sam Irvin, uh, who was at that time the Chief Judge on the United States Court of Appeals for the Fourth Circuit a great opportunity for me to work for him, learn from him so much about the role of judges, the administrative justice, um, and the, uh, the function of the courts. And the Irvin family has had a long tradition of uh, understanding the importance of constitutional rights and adherence to the Constitution. And I very much uh, became a part of uh, that uh, legacy as a clerk for Chief Judge Irvin on the Court of Appeals. For the past 30 years, I've uh, uh, practiced law in Raleigh. I've had cases and clients in every corner of North Carolina. Uh, I was on the legal team in the Leandro case. Some of you may be old enough to remember that Leandro was the a case in which the Supreme Court uh, found a constitutional right for all public school students to a sound basic education. And I was on the, uh, I filed an amicus brief at the Supreme Court. Uh, in that case in support of the students. Um, I have argued cases to a uh, verdict uh, in trial court. I've argued uh, appeals to our appellate courts. Uh, I have a broad range of experience and I'm very much looking forward to giving back to the people of the state of North Carolina as a judge in the Court of Appeals and we appreciate your vote in November or, or before if you vote early voting. Yes, early voting, early voting. Let's all do that. All right, really quickly, I'm gonna give you about a minute and a half to answer this question. What do you think is the role of a judge Sorry in protecting and expanding the productive like freedom? As you've heard before, certainly the role of the judge is to give uh, a faithful interpretation and application of our Constitution. And to understand the importance of the Constitution and the role of the courts to protect the individual rights that are protected by the Constitution regardless of what the legislature and what the General Assembly says. My opponent has been a judge for the last eight years, has uh, written numerous decisions looking at the acts of the General Assembly in the last eight years. And to my knowledge, he has never found the uh, statutes of the General Assembly to be unconstitutional. I think it's important for judges to understand the role of the courts to, ding, ding. to make sure that the uh, constitutional protections are in place 
regardless of what the General Assembly may do. My opponent's never done that in his career, and it's something I would be committed to do if I were a judge in the Court of Appeals to ensure that the rights protected by the Constitution were afforded to every person in the state of North Carolina. That's what I believe the role of the judges would be. Excellent answer. Thank you so much, Judge Styers. Thanks for joining us. Thank I'm going to go ahead and pass it off to Taylor. Okay. Um, next, we'll have um, Judge Chris Brooks, who is also running for the NC um, Court of Appeals. Thank you so much, Taylor. Uh, my name is Chris Brooks. I'm a judge on the North Carolina Court of Appeals. I use he, him, his uh, pronouns. I grew up uh, in Raleigh. Uh, I'm a double Tar Heel. I uh, went to UNC for undergrad uh, and for law school, Go Heels. Uh, I uh, practiced in downtown Raleigh at Cranfield Sumner and Hartzog, a law firm in downtown Raleigh. Uh, and then for more than a decade before being appointed to the bench, I was a public interest attorney uh, in North Carolina. First, I was a staff attorney at the Southern Coalition for Social Justice, uh, doing everything from heirs property work, protecting uh, black family land, uh, especially in the eastern portion of the state, to uh, voting rights work. For the seven years prior to being appointed to the bench by Governor Cooper, I was the legal director of the American Civil Liberties Union of North Carolina, where I litigated on behalf of doctors and women seeking meaningful reproductive to rep access to reproductive freedom uh, in North Carolina. I was appointed by Governor Cooper to our Court of Appeals in April of 2019 with my friend and colleague, Judge Ruben Young, who's on this evening as well. In the year and a half since I've been on the bench, I have written 83 opinions that I think speak to my rigor, independence, uh, and the fact that I'm not gonna be a rubber stamp uh, for any interest. Obviously, to, to go to the question uh, that you're, you're asking this evening, um, and to echo what I've heard a number of uh, my friends who are running on the Democratic slate say, my job is different uh, than as a judge than when I was legal director uh, as ACLU of North Carolina. In that role, I was advocating for a result. And my job as a judge is to look fairly and impartially at the facts that come before us. So uh, as has been said by my friends, you know, we are limited in what we can say um, because we should not be commenting about matters that should, could come before us. And further, even if we wanted to talk about them, each case is different. So we just don't know exactly what we would do until we see the facts of any particular case. So I'm a little bit limited in regards to what I can say. I'll make some factual observations, and these are not forecasting any results. These to me are facts. One, Roe was probably imperiled before the passing of Justice Ginsburg. Justice Ginsburg's passing imperils it further. I think that that is just a fact. More and more challenges to restrictions on reproductive freedom are going to come through the state courts as opposed to the federal courts. We've already started to see that occur. I think that will continue to occur. And ding, ding. Uh, as has been said uh, by Gray and other and Trisha, you know, we have our own state constitution that guarantees uh, equal justice under the law and equal protection to women in North Carolina. And uh, we do not have to interpret our state constitution the exact same way that the Supreme Court of the United States interprets similar provisions in the federal constitution. Thank you so much for the opportunity to speak with you all this evening uh, and for this opportunity. I, I, it's, it's really great to be with you all. Thank you so much. Thank you for joining us. Um, next up, we'll go back to Sarah, um, who will ask a question to our next. Thank you, Taylor. Um, our next candidate is uh, Judge Ruben Young, who's a Democrat running for North Carolina Court of Appeals. Good evening, and thank you very much for the opportunity to be here. My name is Ruben Young. I'm a judge on the North Carolina Court of Appeals. I was appointed in April along with my good friend and colleague, Chris Brook, uh, and I've been serving on the court since then. Uh, I went to junior high school and high school in Raleigh. My dad was a minister. I am a double HBCU graduate, graduating from Howard University in Washington, D.C., the North Carolina Central University School of Law. I've been a prosecutor, a defense attorney, a civil practitioner. I've represented the Department of uh, Crime Control and Public Safety. Uh, in both state and federal court. I've been the secretary of uh, two state agencies, chief legal counsel to a governor, a superior court judge, 
uh, I've run the uh, prison system uh, and I have also uh, served obviously on the uh, Court of Appeal. So in brief, that's my introduction. Great, thank you so much. And for your question, um, is it, it's the same as the question for the, the rest of the judges. Uh, what do you think is the role of a judge in protecting and expanding reproductive freedom? Well, I, I want to echo uh, the responses and the sentiments of my uh, uh, colleagues, but I do want to say that the role of the judge is to apply the law and apply the law fairly to everyone. Uh, the, the drafters of the Constitution, uh, which I have taken a sworn oath to uphold, didn't look like me. And they didn't look like many people on this call. And having said that, what I will say to you is, is that I believe that the Constitution uh, is a living and breathing document to the extent that it needs to be interpreted based on the issues that are raised by the litigants that, become, that come before judges. My position with regard to judges and their responsibilities is that judges need to accept litigants where they are and not where we want them to be or where we expect them to be. Because all of us come from different places, all of us have different challenges with regard to the issues that we face in our lives, but everyone is entitled to the fair application of the law. Ding, ding. Not based on gender, not based on race, not based on economic status. The level, pill, the level field has to be, uh, the playing field has to be leveled, and it's the judge's responsibility to make sure that it is and that the law is fairly applied to everyone. Excellent, great answer. Thank you so much for being with us tonight. Um, and so that segment concludes our, our judges. So um, as a recap, we heard from Judge John Rex Marvel, who's a Democrat running um, in District 26. Uh, we heard from Judge Laura Cubbage, a Democrat running for the North Carolina Court of Appeals. Judge Trisha Shields is a Democrat running for the North Carolina Court of Appeals. Judge Grace Dyers, who is a Democrat running for the North Carolina Court of Appeals. Judge Chris Brooke, a Democrat running for the North Carolina Court of Appeals. And then Judge Ruben Young, who is also a Democrat running for the North Carolina Court of Appeals. Um, and so thank you all for being with us tonight. Um, we are shockingly ahead of schedule. Um, and so we're gonna pause for a minute and we're gonna um, go over some of CRAN's upcoming events. Um, our next segment is Board of County Commissioners and we have four candidates that will be joining us. Um, and so I am going to turn it over to Christina with the North Carolina um, AIDS Action Network and she's gonna talk about an event that we have happening tomorrow night. Thanks, Sarah. So far this evening has been really great and we've had a lot of conversations with amazing judges running and talking about the importance of the role of a judge in how certain cases are adjudicated and its impact on our lives and on issues. You know, it's great to hear that a lot of the judges here are wanting to uphold the constitution and to meet um, people where they're at and to uphold the law, but we know that that's not always the case for all Supreme Court justices or judges in general. And so we know now with the passing of um, Ruth Bader Ginsburg that a lot of the rights that we hold dear, such as healthcare, reproductive freedom, immigration, electoral rights, voting rights, which here in North Carolina is a very relevant issue, are all up for debate, are all on the line. And you know, this is a real time for us to, to really take this threat seriously. And so tomorrow night, or tomorrow evening at 5.30, CRAN, North Carolina AIDS Action Network, and Planned Parenthood will be combining forces and having a phone bank to be able to call our supporters and encourage them to call our senators and let them know that we do not want this process rushed. We don't want this process to happen before the election. And we wanna make sure that the right kinds of justices are nominated and confirmed because we know that a lot of damage can come if we have just any random person in there. So if you're passionate about this issue, if you know people who are passionate about this issue are going to be impacted by any issues that I brought up and then some, 
make sure you take some time, even if it's 30 minutes, make sure you join us for our phone bank tomorrow evening and, and encourage our friends and our supporters to make sure that they make the right decision to call their senators and have them make the right choice. So I'll go ahead and pass it off to Sarah to see where we're at right now in the schedule. Yeah. Great, thank you, Christina. Um, so I hope you all will join us tomorrow night um, and thank you for that great overview. We are gonna um, start our segment with county commissioners. Um, so Christina, I'm gonna pass it back to you um, and I believe we're gonna go to Lee, uh, Lee Altman to begin. Great, all right. Hi so everybody. Introduce Lee Altman, thank you so much for joining us. Um, we're gonna have two questions and I hope in those answers you'll be able to briefly introduce yourself and get the show going. Sounds so, wonderful. The first question I have for you is what is the most pressing issue facing reproductive health today? You'll have two minutes for this question. Go ahead. Well, obviously we all know that women's access to health care is under assault in the United States today because of um, this president and the Republicans that um, rubber stamp him and uh, don't serve any check on his um, egregious and outrageous behavior and words and deeds. Um, and we have to not go backwards. Um, I was born in 1972 when uh, women's access to health care and our rights, um, our rightful place at the table in law and in politics and in business and, and everywhere was really um, ascendant, becoming ascendant. And we can't go backwards. Um, so um, I, you know, I'm thrilled to be here tonight and I'm so thrilled to support the work that you do um, because um, from women's access to uh, reproductive health care to, um, you know, the tax code, women's bodies, our values are um, on the line and at risk. And uh, we need to be at the table and ensuring that our values and our priorities um, get our full due and written the respect um, and uh, the protections to which we are entitled. Um, you know, I am very interested um, as a county, uh, and let me just take before I more directly answer your question, let me give everyone just a bit of background. Ding, ding. Oh, sorry, I'm sorry, there's two questions. So I'll answer this and then I'll give the background whenever you'd like me to. Um, I am very interested here in Mecklenburg County in ensuring that women do have access to uh, reproductive health care. Um, all women, women of color, immigrant women, young women, um, and that's something that I've already begun the work of, 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 of um, getting down to business with, with talking to Upstream and some other great advocates here in the community. Um, and I, I will be pursuing that uh, come December. Excellent, excellent. Hopefully you'll get to finish your thought with this next question. Um, do you support the use of chemical agents on protesters by law enforcement? Do I support the use of chemical agents? Uh, no, I do not. Um, I think that the, um, the right to protest is our most fundamental right. Um, when I was a kid, um, I wanted to be an ACLU lawyer more than anything because as a young Jewish girl and um, the uh, great granddaughter of Holocaust victims, I was so impressed um, that our right to free speech and to protest was so sacrosanct that the ACLU would even protect um, neo-Nazis marching in Skokie, Illinois. So we protect speech, we protect people raising up their voices even when we don't like it, and certainly when their cause is just. So um, 100%, um, we should not be using chemical warfare um, on our residents. Um, um, no, we should not. Go ahead, do you wanna finish? Oh wait, I think we have a, we have a Facebook question. Actually. Okay. So I'll give you the opportunity to answer that. Um, public health may be severely challenged in the near future if Roe v. Wade fail, falls. What will be the preparations you would recommend to face this situation? It's a little out of your purview, but- It is I a little bit. Um, I guess what I would say is that if we lose federal protection, then all the more 
urgent that we elect Democrats up and down the ballot here in North Carolina to ensure that we have protection statewide. Meanwhile, you know, we would do everything we could to, you know, God forbid, change the outcome. Um, you know, if we didn't get the representation that we needed um, at the at the the national level, um, we would just need to double down to fight to roll that back. But um, what could you know, be done on the county level? In at, your the county, at the county level, um, you know, I look forward to hearing from Susan Rodriguez McDowell, who is currently serving um, serving out her first term. She may have a deeper insight into this. You know, I I um, can tell you that women's access ding, to reproductive health care. Oh, I'm sorry, did you say my time is up? You no, I just said ding, ding, 30 seconds. Oh, you know, this is an extremely high priority for me. Um, we all must have access to um, reproductive planning. And I can't think of a more important priority for me as a woman, as a lawyer, as a mother, um, to ensure that women can order their lives in the way that they see fit. And I will do everything in my power at the county level to be sure that we are funding that and providing that access. That's the answer that I can give you today. Excellent, thank you so much. Thank you for, for being flexible and getting some Facebook questions too. We appreciate your time and your energy. I'm gonna go ahead and pass it off to Taylor. Thank, Thank you. you again. Thank you. Um, next up, we will have um, Laura Meyer, who is running for the um, Board of County Commissioners, uh, District 5. Um, thank you for joining us. I have my first question for you is, um, what is the most pressing issue facing reproductive health care today? Hey, good evening, everybody. Thank you for having me, and thank you so much for um, having this forum. Great subject. Um, I'm 100% uh, for women's rights, for women's reproductive freedoms, 100% period. Um, I think what we're facing right now with our, uh, with the, I think the biggest pressing issue right now is education and, and accessibility to contraception. Um, I, I don't think that abortion is going to um, become unlawful, but what I think that, uh, I don't think that's gonna happen, I really don't. I think we're gonna to have to fight it for a long time. We're gonna to have to continue to protect it. But I think, I don't think it's gonna be unlawful. Um, I think getting contraception to into the hands of women and young women, I think is imperative to um, stopping unintended pregnancies. And so um, if, we can, if we can strengthen our education, our sex education, um, I think that is imperative and getting contraception into the hands of teenagers who we all know are not going to stop having sex and they need we need to give them education so that they can make informed choices on um, their future because it is a big big decision for them and they need the information um, to make those informed choices. Thank you. Um, I think that that's really important. And I'm glad that you connected that um, with the discussion of abortion access. Um, my next question for you is the same um, that we just heard from um, regarding the use of chemical agents. Do you support the use of chemical agents on uh, protesters by um, law enforcement? I do not support chemical agents. Um, I, I, I do worry about tying our hands um, because we don't know what the future holds. And I think right now, what is so um, in our minds right now is what happened uh, Trade Street downtown to peaceful protesters. They were peaceful. I know people in that group, it was horrifying. I hope the um, officers are held accountable. What I worry about um, is the future because this could turn and it could be QAnon protesters coming in. There could be violence. And I think that we have to have something that can disperse a crowd. I know city council yesterday um, voted um, and, and our new police chief um, has come forward and said, we're not gonna use chemical agents anymore. Um, we're gonna use pepper spray. And I, it's not a chemical agent. Pepper spray is not a chemical agent. It does not disperse um, widely. And I think that's important. Um, I don't wanna tie the hands of law enforcement, um, but I don't want to I'm not, I'm not a fan of, chem, of chemical agents, particularly for peaceful protesters, which is an obvious statement. Um, 
so that I, I just worry about the future and what we don't know. So I don't want to tie our law enforcement's hands, but I don't support chemical agents. I hope that makes sense. Hmm. Okay. Uh, pepper spray is not considered a chemical agent. Um, <laughs> it was originally intended for bears, but, but it's not considered a chemical agent. Um, and it, it is not, that's what city council and that is what our city has just now adopted. Um, I find that to be a, a better situation than what they did this summer with um, our peaceful protesters, um, without a doubt. Otherwise, what I fear is that they're gonna use batons and they're gonna use guns. And I think that is way worse than any, any of the other two alternatives. So um, as far as alternatives go, I think pepper spray is better than chemical agents and they're all better than guns and batons. Thank you for clarifying. And um, I think that those were the only two questions that I had for you right now. Um, so we, I will pass it back to Sarah, who will be introducing our next candidate. But thank you so much for taking the time to join us today. Thank you, Taylor. Um, our next candidate is uh, Commissioner Pat Cotham, who's a Democrat who's running uh, at large for Board of County Commission. Uh, so welcome, Commissioner Cotham. Thank you for joining us today. Um, and you have two minutes and your first question is, what is the most pressing issue facing reproductive health today? I think we have to, un you, um, can you unmute? Okay, is that better? Yep, I can hear you, thank you. Okay, great, all right, well thank you. And I'm sorry I was late in arriving, I was at another, uh, event. Uh, you know, we are faced with um, a, a, a change in the Supreme Court. And, um, but I do think that we have to remember that it's likely the Supreme Court uh, would kick it back to the states. And so I think the most important thing that we need to do for women's health and reproductive options is to make sure that all our legislators, that we elect legislators uh, that are focused on women's health and pro-choice. Uh, that is critical and that's also for our um, congressional representatives and because they are the ones who are gonna have the most say on this. Uh, as, as being a county commissioner of the city council, we're not real involved, um, but we certainly, um, so that is the, the main thing that we have to do uh, because I, I worry about you know, women's health and um, not only in Mecklenburg County, but in neighboring and other counties throughout the state. And there are, there are counties that don't, that don't even have a, an obstetrician or a gynecologist, uh, some of the rural counties and they don't have hospitals. And so we really need to make sure that we elect women and men who are ding, ding. trying to support that. Uh, thank you. Uh, so you have 30 seconds left. And um, if I could just follow up to that with that question. Um, so the public health department is um, under the purview of the county. So do you see a connection with reproductive health care um, and the, the role of the public health department? Uh, no, not, it's not really connected. I mean, we do, um, uh, we do some things, but we're not, it's not like we're a clinic. So, uh, but we do have uh, pap smears and we test for, uh, you know, uh, diseases. And so uh, that's important, um, but we don't really make the decisions about, um, uh, so we, you know, we do that, but we don't, we don't, we're not a clinic. I wish we were, but we're not. Okay, thank you for that. And then your second question, and you have three minutes for this one is, do you support the use of chemical agents on protesters by law enforcement? Well, I don't need three minutes for that for sure because I do not support that. Uh, but again, the county commission, we're not, um, you know, that the, the city council is over the police and we have, a, the state has made the relationship uh, that the, uh, the sheriff works directly for the people. So we cannot tell the sheriff to do or not do anything, and um, uh, but we do, you know, we do encourage him, and we certainly are happy uh, with him, and he's doing a great job, and uh, I, and I would hope that 
it, you know, that he would not use chemical weapons and he hasn't. Uh, so um, we don't, but again, I just, it's important. People often think that we can tell the sheriff what to do and we cannot um, because that's a state, that's how the state has it set up. But just as a private citizen um, and elected official, uh, I, I'm, I am against that. I think it was terrible what happened, you know, earlier this year uptown. Great, thank you so much for those answers to your questions and thank you for joining us tonight. Um, I am going to pass it over to uh, Christina who's going to introduce uh, our last candidate for uh, Board of County Commissioners. Thank you, Sarah. Next we'll be having Susan Rodriguez McDowell. Thank you so much for joining us this evening. Sure. Your first question, you'll have two minutes and you'll be given a 30 second warning just to give you a heads up. <laughs> um, first question is, what is the most pressing issue facing reproductive health today? Uh, thank you. Uh, first of all, thank you for having me. Um, it is a huge privilege for me to be here with you all. I think the work that you're doing is tremendous and I'm really excited to be partnering with you in some of that work. Um, but I would have to say, uh, you know, the obvious answer is of course what's happening in the courts but i would like to address uh an, it, it address it a different way and that is to say that racism is a public health crisis in mecklenburg county um, black maternal mortality rates um, is i would say an issue that is uh is, is akin to access. Um, the fact that highly educated black women have worse outcomes than white women who have not graduated from high school is something that many people are just really not aware of. Um, I think our community, this is, this is a message that we need to teach the community. Um, and so, and, and you know, why is this the case? And, and it's because of racial disparities right and bias um, uh, these are things that um, are becoming more and more evident as we deal with covid and as we deal with um, education in our schools the racial disparities that we experience ding, ding. Uh, are affecting even this issue so uh, i believe it's vitally important um, that we that we address this um, it's vitally important that women who are uh, have autonomy over their bodies, um, they must uh, be able to choose when and if they want to give birth. Um, I think access must be protected. I think access to birth control must be protected. Access to sex education must be protected. Um, oh shoot, okay. Well, don't worry, don't worry. You'll have three extra minutes for your next question. Oh, okay. You can finish your thought then. Okay. Um, but I, I do want to note that it's great that you pointed out the racial health disparities and how that is just um, connected to a lot of different other disparities, to be honest. But we're talking about healthcare today and reproductive freedom. But yeah, the disparities are stark. Yeah. Um, the next question I have for you, I have three minutes. Do you support the use of chemical agents on protesters by law enforcement? Yeah, I don't really need three minutes on that because no, I don't support. Uh, I think it's, it's, it's proven that uh, we don't use chemical weapons in warfare anymore. Okay, so why are we using it on our own people? I think um, it's also known that it can cause miscarriages um, in women. So this is important. I think a lot of times people don't think of this as being an issue that women are concerned about or that women should be concerned about. Um, they don't see, they, you know, they don't see this as an everybody issue. Um, and, and women are part of everybody, right? So it is, it is our issue too. Um, and so, yes, um, I, I don't believe that we should be using chemical agents on any of our people, especially women, but on any people. Um, I, I do think I agree with uh, what uh, soon to be Commissioner uh, Meyer said about not wanting to totally take out 
uh, the tools that help de-escalate from guns and um, batons and physical, you know, beating of people. Um, but it, because, as she pointed out, there are protesters, uh, you know, that are that are coming in uh, that we that we really need to be protected from. And so, you know. I think we, we don't want to completely um, tie the hands of law enforcement. And so I think it's really important that we have a balance. I think we have to focus more on de-escalation and in training for de-escalation, not uh, having uh, our, our protectors of the public being people that are harming the public. They, they need to be taught more about de-escalation. And so I think, you know, that goes all the way back to recruitment of the people that we are, uh, that are policing our public. And so, um, and as Commissioner Cotham said, that's not really our wheelhouse. Uh, you know, that really is more of a CMPD uh, type of issue. But I think as leaders in the community, it's important for us to convey our values and what we believe um, so that we can use whatever pulpit that we have to be able Ding -ding. to talk about it. So anyways, maybe I did use three minutes talking about it. I didn't think I would need to. Uh, but I have a follow up. I want to actually okay. I appreciate your answer um, on the chemical agents. I do want to follow up with what you were talking about earlier about um, <laughs> racial health disparities, particularly around reproductive freedom. You mentioned um, maternal mortality. Um, I would add infant mortality to yes. that as well. Absolutely. Um, and you know, when it comes to access to um, maternal health care, you know, during the pregnancy, following the pregnancy, which is not covered by Medicaid for, you know, most people giving birth. Right. Um, and that's a problem because we know that it doesn't end there. Um, yeah. I would love for you to expound more just on uh, the racial disparities that, you've, that you know about in the context of reproductive freedom and you know what consequences can come as a result if we don't address these um these uh inequities because i know that you know there are a lot of different kinds of contributing factors i know one particularly amongst the black community there is that inherent medical mistrust that has come from you know history of you know, having experiments done without consent, right. um, being forced to sterilize, which we've been hearing about in ICE recently, yeah. which is appalling. Yeah. Um, so I would love, if you would love to spend a little time, we have a little extra time, so I would love for you to have a little freedom to be able to talk a bit more about that, because I think you're right, a lot of people don't often make that connection or are unaware that these issues exist. Yeah, absolutely. I think, I think that, um, you know, I, I also serve on the, uh, the child fatality uh, and abuse, uh, abuse prevention, child fatality prevention and abuse protection. Anyway, CFPPT um, is a task force that I really have learned so much about, um, you know, our families and, and our mothers um, who are struggling to take care of their children. And maybe they were children that, you know, they, they didn't have access to reproductive health care. And so um, they didn't have, maybe they didn't have access to birth control. Maybe they didn't have access. Maybe they weren't able to make the choice of becoming a mother when they did. Maybe there's all kinds of factors. And then the, the follow-up with those children, um, you know, that, that becomes a cycle, right? Um, and so I think that, you know, this disproportionately affects low-income, um, you know, uh, people and so it families and so I think um, it's it's super important that we we have to it just feels like our society is upside down and backwards in so many ways and 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 it feels overwhelming sometimes but what do you tackle first but all of these things have to be tackled together and um, uh, there was something that you at the very beginning I wanted to say and I just you know, I totally went out of my head. Um, no worries, no worries. We'll give you a second. We'll let um, Lee Altman, if you wanted to add a statement, and then maybe afterwards, it'll come back to you. 
Yeah, no, it wasn't anything big. It was just a, it was just something little that you you talked about, you, you touched on, and, and it just escaped me. Sorry about that. Medical mistrust. We can circle back, but yes. Oh, that's what it was. It was about. It was about. Yeah, yeah. It was about our uh, women, black and brown women, who their experience is not is not honored. It's not listened to. It's not valued. It's discounted, right? So you're conveying your feelings, your, your pain, your uh, symptoms, things like that, but it's, uh, it's, it's not taken seriously. And so the outcomes are worse. And that was exactly what I was uh, trying to touch on. So thank oh, you. Thank you for sharing. Glad that you remembered. Yeah. That is very real. That is very real. Uh, Lee Altman, go ahead with your statement. Thank you. I just remembered, since I'm talking to this group, that there is something I'm really interested in. If anybody on this call is, I'd love for you to reach out and connect with me. And that's access specifically to LARC's long-acting reversible contraception. Um, I um, have been really focused on access um, through our public health department. I've gotten information that they're in short supply, um, people can't get them, and you know they're expensive in the short term, but they're very cost-effective over the course of the protection they provide. And, um, you know, they're like the number one recommended course of uh, contraception, even for antepartum women, you know, not just postpartum women. Um, and a lot of that's changed since I was coming of age back in the 90s and so forth, and trying to disseminate that information and get good information into the hands of um, people of reproductive age. And that's, so I'm very interested in that subject. Um, and I would love to um, talk to anyone offline about that, if that's an interest of yours. And my email is votelealtman at gmail.com. And thanks so much for the opportunity. Thank you. Thank you, Lee. Thank you, Susan, both of y'all for sharing. Um, I feel like we got more than we bargained for with y'all. So thank y'all so much for, for taking that time and being generous. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and pass it off to Taylor. We just finished our county commissioner section and we're gonna be going off to the next segment. So I'll pass it off to Taylor. Okay, thank you, Christina. Um, and I will be introducing um, Senator um, Mujapa Muhammad, um, who is in Senate District 38. Um, and I'm excited to ask you a few questions. You're actually my state senator, so that's helpful. Um, I'm interested to know what is the most pressing issue facing reproductive health care today? Uh, good evening, everyone. Thank you so much to the network for inviting me to having this wonderful platform and forum. Uh, again, my name is Mushtaba Mohammed. Uh, proud to serve you all in the North Carolina Senate. Taylor, great question. Uh, and what I will tell you is one of the most pressing questions is, look, many of you already know 2020 was already a critical election year. And with the passing of Justice Ginsburg, now more than ever, we have to honor her legacy and work even harder in North Carolina to take the North Carolina House and the North Carolina Senate's majority. Uh, in the North Carolina Senate, we're five seats away from taking that and securing it because we've got to do everything right now. Uh, more than ever before to make sure that our state doesn't turn into an Alabama, a Georgia, or Kentucky, where these states have already worked hard and passed legislation to restrict women's reproductive rights. Um, look, take, for example, in North Carolina, our General Assembly, under this leadership, we, they've already worked on bills like Born Alive, uh, Senate Bill 359, I believe, that basically criminalized doctors for uh, providing abortion access to, to women. And that's unfortunate. And it's because of all your efforts in 2018, because of your belief in justice, equity, that you helped us break that Republican supermajority. And that's when we had Governor Cooper. And in North Carolina Senate, we have exactly 21 Democrats. And it's because of the progress that you made that we were able to stop that bill and make sure that the Republicans were not able to override it in the North Carolina House. Uh, because I'll tell you, before we came in 2018, under this leadership, they overrode the governor almost 23 times, my friends. Ding, ding. 23 times. So real quick, the other thing, 30 seconds left, is making sure we have a budget that reflects our values. So we, instead of uh, investing in crisis pregnancy centers, which is one of the line items I've seen again and again, we've got to make sure we're investing our state tax dollars on mental health, uh, on maternal health programs, like nurse family partnerships to help low-income families expand access to contraception care, comprehensive sex education to provide medically sound, accurate information. Of course, expanding Medicaid to almost 600,000 North Carolinians. That is where our value should be. Thank you, Anna. 
Yeah. Um, yeah. Thank you so much. I do agree. I think that um, crisis pregnancy centers are a, such a huge issue. So I'm glad that you highlighted that in your answer. Um, my second question for you is just um, regarding um, chemical agents. Do you support the use of chemical agents um, that have been used against protesters um, by law enforcement in recent recent times? In, in one word, I'm going to say absolutely no. Do not support the use of chemical agents. But what I will say to you, Taylor, is look, uh, a little over four months ago, George Floyd was murdered in broad daylight. And the reality is that black lives do matter. They don't just matter on Martin Luther King Day or Black History Month. They matter each and every single day, especially until we have these systems of injustice. Because I can't continue to hear, I can't breathe. We can't continue to hear, please don't kill me. I'm about to die. The folks in the streets right now are protesting another pandemic, and that's called racism. And Taylor, I'm proud to tell you that I've been appointed by Governor Cooper to the North Carolina Task Force on Racial Equity and Criminal Justice. I'm one of two from Mecklenburg County, and I'm the only one from the state Senate on that task force. And we're already looking at great recommendations for our state, like making sure our officers are well-trained. That's where investments need to be made. Making sure police officers get de-escalation de training. Uh, crisis intervention training, making sure they get implicit bias training. That is where the resources need to be spent instead of purchasing and using chemical agents on our streets. These agents are already banned in, in war zones, so they should be banned in Charlotte, North Carolina. Uh, so I'm proud to make sure we have budgets that reflect our values. We need more transparency. We need more accountability in law enforcement. But my friends, what I will tell you, a lot of these bills are already in committees. But because of this Republican leadership in our state house and state senate a lot of these bills forget a floor vote they don't get a committee vote they do not see the light of day so folks like myself and so many other legislators from our wonderful delegation that you're going to hear from today are working hard right now more than ever to take the majority of the north carolina house and senate we only need five more seats we're going to do it uh, because this is a critical critical election uh, last thing i'll tell you if we don't take the majority uh, in 2020 because of redistricting in the census then North Carolina is going to go even further backwards for the next decade. So yes, we're excited to get rid of the man in the White House for the next four years, but we also got to take the majority for the next decade in North Carolina. Awesome. Thank you so much. I think that was a um, really powerful um, connection that you made to the importance of local elections. So thank you. Um, I look forward to voting for you in November. And I will um, pass it back to Sarah, who will be um, introducing our next speaker. Great, thank you. Um, thank you, Taylor. And our next speaker is going to be uh, DeAndrea Salvador. And DeAndrea is running for North Carolina State Senate in District 39. Sarah, thank you. Hi, thank you for joining us. Uh, so we have two questions for you today. Um, and the first question, you'll have um, two minutes to answer. Uh, what do you think is the most pressing issue facing reproductive health today? Yeah, absolutely. And I think Senator Muhammad put it really excellently. Um, there are a number of things, but that really escalated just over a week ago with the passing of Ruth Bader Ginsburg. Um, I think the stakes are even higher than what they were already in 2020. Um, there are a number of things that we have to be considering, whether that be racial disparities in maternal health, um, whether that be looking at expanding access to Medicaid and ensuring that that has access to reproductive health care. Um, we have to one, be looking at ways to increase accessibility and access and affordability. But we also have to make sure that we are protecting the things that are already in place and we're getting folks elected who are committed to doing that. Um, Senator Muhammad mentioned really clearly um, that there are a lot of great bills that he mentioned have not even seen the light of committee. And that's one of the reasons why I'm running is to flip the five, one of the five seats that we need for the North Carolina State Senate and also gives all our great delegation here in Mecklenburg more support. Um, so those couple of things are definitely big ones for me. I also believe that we have to give a true comprehensive sex education program. We need to be supporting um, so many of the great initiatives that are happening here at the state, whether that be Planned Parenthood or others. Um, and yeah, I just plan to be an advocate for a number of those things. Great, thank you so much. Um, I loved how you made the connection uh, between 
by expanding Medicaid and sex education. I think a lot of people think that reproductive justice is just about access to abortion. And we all know that it's not, right? That we also have to advocate for um, just holistically reproductive health care, whether that's just going to the doctor um, when you have a cold or getting your annual checkup. So um, I liked how you made that connection. Your next question, uh, and you have three minutes to answer this question, is do you support the use of chemical agents on protesters by law enforcement? I absolutely do not support that. Um, and particularly in regards to what we're talking about today with reproductive justice, reproductive health care, we've seen folks who have uteruses or um, other reproductive body parts have serious long-term impacts that come from the use of those chemicals. And we have to think about the impact that that is having on folks long-term and just also on the lungs and things of that sort. And so I believe that that's not something that we should be doing to our community members, to our neighbors, and it's absolutely not something that I support. Great, thank you. Um, and also thank you for uplifting uh, gender neutral language around uh, people that seek abortions, um, that it's people who have uteruses and not women are not the only individuals that have uteruses. Um, so thank you for joining us today. I am going to pass it over to Christina, who's going to introduce our next candidate. Thanks, Sarah. Um, I'm going to introduce Senator Natasha Marcus. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. I'm going to kick off with our first question. You'll have two minutes and you'll get a 30 second uh, warning for time. So the first question, what is the most pressing issue facing reproductive health today? Um, thank you for having me, first of all. Uh, just a little introduction for anyone who's not met me. I'm Natasha Marcus, serving my first term in the North Carolina Senate, proudly so. One of only seven women, female Democrats, in the North Carolina Senate. So we are really looking forward to having DeAndrea Salvador be Senator Salvador and join us. So um, I, am the, I am the mother of two daughters, um, so I care about these issues for everyone, but also for my own daughters who are in their 20s. Um, and, you know, th these issues matter. I also myself have, um, in addition to having two live births, suffered three miscarriages in my life. So I also understand the pain that can come from pregnancy. And so it's personal in that way as well. Um, I've been a strong voice for choice since joining the Senate, endorsed by Planned Parenthood, proudly so. Um, I am never embarrassed to stand up and speak about this issue because we need to do that as women. Um, and, and as uh, honestly as North Carolinians who care about choice, not just women. Um, so if I have to pick one most pressing issue, I would say with the passing of Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg, it is the fact that our Supreme Court is now gonna tilt way to the right, way farther to the right than the typical um, US citizen believes. Most citizens believe that a woman should control her own body and reproductive choices and that abortion should not be illegal in North Carolina, but the Supreme Court is gonna disagree with that. And what that means is the state legislatures are gonna be then in the position of deciding what your rights are to, to, mm -hmm. to control your reproductive health. And we have Phil Berger running the Senate right now, and he's awful. He's awful. He is not who you want making your decisions for you about whether to continue a pregnancy or not and the reasons that you might be making those choices. And so to me, the most pressing issue is to get rid of him as the, power, as the most powerful legislator in the state. And that's what I've been working on to try to, we can't unelect him because he's in a very safe Republican district, but we can get him out of the power chair by electing more Democrats like Senator Salvador. Thank That's you, right. Senator Marcus. Thank you for being explicit, naming names, <laughs> not being scared. <laughs> uh, the next question, you'll have a little more time. You'll have three minutes for this question. Do you support the use of chemical agents on protesters by law enforcement? I don't need three minutes. My answer is no. I mean, I'll expand just because I don't want to- have three minutes, go ahead and use it if you want to talk yeah. about something else. <laughs> um, we'll have a 30 second warning again, go ahead. Yeah, the answer is no. I mean, they don't even use it in warfare and we're using it on mostly uh, nonviolent protesters in the streets of Charlotte. No, that's not appropriate. And I was just briefed today by Mayor Lyles and the new police chief and they have 
reiterated, you've probably all heard that they are going to stop using what they call the CS gas. Now that's not all gas, they're still gonna use the pepper spray when needed and we can debate whether that's good or not, it's better than bullets. Um, and if I suppose if they're gonna feel like they need to use something, I suppose pepper spray is within there. But I do worry about the results, of sp specifically that CS gas causing, I read about how it, ca it caused at least one woman to have a miscarriage. I mean, that is unconscionable. I have been in protests, not those late night ones. I'm honestly too scared to go um, because I, and I worry that's exactly what those strong arm police tactics are trying to do, discourage people from protesting, but I've been at a lot of protests. And so, um, and I, you know, I encourage my daughters to go and speak and be heard about whatever issue is on their mind. Women's March and Black Lives Matter. Those are the ones I go to. And if suddenly it turned into, I might, you know, be subjected to life-threatening chemical agents for that, that just can't be the America that, that we support. So no, the answer is no, I do not support the use of those um, chemicals. And, and I also, I'm on, I'm on a work group for, with the Senate Democrats on what kind of police reform we need. And so we're looking at way beyond just banning the, those chemical agents and you know banning chokeholds. And I'm very concerned with how a police officer that was subject to um, action because of their bad behavior can be rehired somewhere else and those records aren't shared and kept secret. That's a really weird system that only applies to police officers. It's not okay because nobody should want a bad apple rehired in a new place. They're not gonna suddenly become a good apple usually. Um, and then uh, access to the body cam. You know, the reason we have body cam is so that there's more transparency, but in North Carolina, we have one of the, uh, we have one of the toughest rules in the whole nation of how to make those available to the public. Um, and so we want to change that. And if we, if we can get to, back to my first answer, if we can get to a point where we're not in Amen. the minority and always getting shut down all the time, we can make some changes on this. You know, I know not all police are bad. A lot of police are good. Um, but we just can't have, as Chris Rock says, this is one of those professions where you just can't have bad apples. You know? <laughs> police officers, pilots, doctors, you can't have bad apples, right? And so, um, yeah, it's part of a bigger mission for me and my Senate, fellow Senate Democrats to address all of these issues, chemical agents and more. Yeah, and it's, and it's great that you, you brought that up because I feel like, you know, you notice a, a trend with just the the government in one way or another perpetuating harm whether it be through different types of chemical compounds depending on pepper spray depending on batons bullets you know but it can even come back to you know our bodily autonomy and you know that's why you know with issues that we are concerned with you know that independence that right to protest is very important because it directly ties back to having bodily autonomy. And, you know, he, here in Charlotte specifically, unfortunately, there are a lot of protests that happen for a lot of, a lot of issues, but specifically around abortion. And, you know, I think that there are some people who have opinions as to why people get abortions, the, the rationale behind that. Um, but as you briefly shared earlier, there are a lot of different types of scenarios and situations surrounding pregnancy. It's not always good, you know? Um, so I would love to just hear your thoughts on, on that when you, you have people who use that right and privilege that we have to protest, but use it in a way to impact other people's bodily autonomy without even having that full background or narrative, which is so frustrating. But I'd love to hear your thoughts and um, if you have any any suggestions on how to fix that? <laughs> <laughs> fix it? No, if I could fix it, I would have. Um, I will say shout out to the people who, who are willing to show up week after week to walk with people who are entering the, the Planned Parenthoods and, and other places, some of which are going for an abortion, but some of which are just there to get a pap smear, honestly, but need someone to walk with them to protect them from the people who are out there protesting. I support the right of anybody to protest, they can protest. But when it gets you know, to the point where you're intimidating, often young women who are already in a really difficult spot as it is, it 
starts to feel pretty predatory, doesn't it? Um, and so I think the city of Charlotte needs to do a better job in enforcing what those laws are, those really loud megaphones that they use that make people crazy inside the building all day long. Um, so there are limits on what, what should be permitted as protesting in my mind. Um, but you certainly don't see the uh, chemical agents and the pepper spray coming out over there at the, um, at the clinics, do you? <laughs> it seems to always be the Black Lives Matter protesters that get the chemical agents. Um, so yeah, I don't know how to fix all that. I just know this is America and we have to protect the right to protest, but there, there should be limits on it. And we, when people are being peaceful, nonviolent protesting, um, they should be met with a peaceful response. Ooh, all right, let me give you one final follow-up. I know you mentioned a buzzword that I love hearing, Medicaid expansion. Yes. Um, that is definitely super important. So can you give me five reasons why North Carolina should expand Medicaid? Oh my gosh, there's probably more than five, but you're putting me on set here. So um, it would bring a ton of jobs, medical and non-medical jobs. Um, it would be a boost to our economy because we are talking billions of, of our taxpayer dollars that we've already paid that would come back to North Carolina to cover our people and pay for uncompensated care. It would keep um, rural hospitals open. There was one that closed just around the corner from Phil Berger's own uh, home and they were begging him to expand Medicaid because they have so much uncompensated care. They can't stay in business. He still won't do it. Um, so keep rural hospitals open. It's the moral thing to do because it literally will save lives and make people you know, more healthy because they can get preventative care and not rely on a free clinic. Before I was a senator, I uh, worked at a community center where one, our most, um, most commonly requested service was our free medical clinic because there are so many people who are working, often more than one job, but cannot afford to see a doctor and they don't have health insurance. And so they rely on, you know, it's good that we had it there, but it, we can't treat everybody and we can't treat you if you have a serious condition. Um, it would avoid bankruptcy. So many families end up in bankruptcy because of medical bills. That only happens in America because we have such a messed up system and actually happens more in North Carolina, one of the last few states to do it, um, to expand Medicaid. Um, there's another reason because all the other states that have done it and there's a, you know, all but 12 others have expanded Medicaid, have been so pleased with the results that they have not changed their mind. You know, even Indiana under Mike Pence, you know, like really um, red states have expanded Medicaid because they see all these reasons. There's only one reason not to do it and they won't admit it, but the reason they won't do it is because Obama passed it and they don't like him or anything about him, anything with his name on it. And that is not a good reason to deny half a million people health care in North Carolina. Yes, I mean, Commissioner McDowell, Rod Rodriguez McDowell said it earlier, that racism really is a public health crisis. And it will <laughs> kill. It will kill. So yeah. thank you so much for, for joining thank us you. and for talking with us about these issues. I'm going to go ahead and pass it off to Taylor. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Um, thank you, Christina. Um, now we will begin to prepare for the um, NC State House candidate portion of this um, candidate forum, but I will just plug our Tuesday event um, that is coming up, a couple of different Tuesday events, but um, for CRAN, for Charlotte Reproductive Action Network, um, we will be hosting um, a documentary virtual screening of um, Belly of the Beast and a talk back. Um, so CRAN is partnering with Sister Song and the ACLU of North Carolina for this screening. Um, and this event will be moderated by Charmaine Lang, the in NC representative for Sister Song, as well as um, Christy Puckett uh, with the um, ACLU of North Carolina. And this um, film will just really discuss um, illegal sterilizations in a California women's prison. And it will just, dig allow people to dig deeper into um, the discussion around reproductive justice. So we hope that you can join us for that. Um, and then I'll just also plug that um, Planned Parenthood will also be hosting Planned Parenthood Votes South Atlantic. We'll also have a um, candidate, um, Mecklenburg County candidate event um, featuring um, some of the candidates that will be here tonight, as well as um, a, another um, candidate in um, Cabarrus County who will join later. We will also have another virtual event um, at 7 p.m. Um, for the state Senate candidate in um, South Carolina. Both of those events are also linked on our Facebook page as well as the CRAN um, Facebook page. Yeah. So we will follow up from this event, just linking all the events that we've mentioned, um, our phone bank tomorrow, and the 
three events that I just mentioned will be taking place next Thursday, um, next Tuesday. And I will now introduce our next candidate who is, um, She's the current State House Representative, Mary Belk, who is, is serving in um, District 88. Thank you for joining us, Mary Belk. It is my pleasure to be here, and thank you, Cran, and uh, for allowing us to come here and talk to you tonight. Thank you. And my first question for you is, um, what is the most pressing issue um, that is facing reproductive health care today, in your opinion? In my opinion, I think it's the fact that North Carolina has a majority Republican uh, General Assembly that controls the General Assembly. I think they're constantly making policy designed to curtail a woman's right to make their own decisions about their health care, about their reproduction, and to have access to affordable and safe abortions. I think they constantly underfund those things that we know also are really important for uh, women and their health. And that's access to good health care, that's access to stable housing, it's access to having a job that gives you a living wage in order for you to be able to afford uh, health care and stable housing. Uh, I think in the past that we relied on the court system to stop the bad policy that um, and I'm talking about North Carolina, but I could be talking this whole truth to states across this nation. Uh, we relied on the courts to make those decisions, to stop those policies, and we can no longer do that. No matter who wins the, who wins the presidency, who takes control of uh, the Congress, we know that we are going to have a 6-3 right-wing majority on the Supreme Court. So in order to not only stop that bad policy or not, we don't need for it to get out of legislatures. And in order to do that, we have to have Democrats in charge and we have to elect more women. Um, we, are, we only represent 25% of the, the elected officials in North Carolina and we represent 51 of the uh, percent of the population. So we need Democrats in there to make policy in order for women to have those things that they need to be healthy. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I think that that is um, a really important issue that you've raised. And I know that, um, well, I guess we can't go deeper into it, but I think that um, my second, my follow-up question is around um, chemical agents. Do you support the use of um, chemical agents on protesters by law enforcement? Um, I don't know if anyone else, I, I'm sorry, I wasn't listening to everyone else because I was kind of going over what I was going to say, but um, I don't know if anyone mentioned that tonight, you know, we had talked with the uh, mayor and uh, with the uh, uh, chief of police and they, and we talked about the fact that they have now decided that they are not going to use CS um, uh, chemical agents, which I applaud um, their irritants and we don't need those. Now, having said that, what I'm going to say is, fundamentally, people protesting is in the Constitution. We have a right to protest, to peacefully protest, to, uh, to have our grievances heard by our government. And I do not support anything that in any way stops that from happening. I, I understand, I understand that there are things that have to happen when people get out of control. But those things, and, and they talk about they're still gonna use pe pepper spray, chemical agents, I'm glad they're not going to do that. But I think it has to be strictly, there has to be a policy, and people have to be trained in it if they're going to do that, and they have to follow that policy. You know, we saw that in, uh, in uh, the protests where people felt that they were boxed in and, um, and had no avenue of escape. Uh, whether or not we can, you know, we're going to argue all day whether or not that was true. What I saw that to be true. So in those cases, do not use an agent on peaceful protesters. If you are going to do that, it has to be because you are saving people's lives or your or yourselves as police officers. Um, it's unacceptable any other way, and there has to be repercussions if those policies that you train for are not met. Yes, 
Um, thank you for taking a stance on that. I think that um, we appreciate you being able to um, join us tonight. And um, I will now pass it to yeah. Sarah, who will introduce our next state house candidate. Thanks again. Great, thank you so Thanks much. Um, and thank you, Representative Belk, for that great response um, and for being here today. Um, so our next candidate is Terry Brown, um, who is a Democrat who is running for North Carolina State House uh, District 92. Hey, thank you, everybody. My name is Terry Brown. I'm looking forward to the discussion tonight running for North Carolina House District 92, which covers uh, southwest Mecklenburg, the west side of Charlotte, all the way down to Steel Creek and the South Carolina border. Awesome. Thank you for being here tonight. I have two questions for you. Um, the first question is, what do you think is the most pressing issue facing reproductive health today? Absolutely. Uh, I think the biggest issue that we're facing right now in our state and across the country is access. And when I say access, I mean that in multiple different ways. Uh, we're talking about making sure that women have the autonomy to decide what goes on with their bodies and how to get reproductive access here in North Carolina. And also uh, making sure that we're not putting up artificial barriers to getting there. So it's not just a legislation on what can and cannot go on. Um, with abortions or other reproductive access, access to uh, birth controls, but it's also making sure that when a woman makes that decision uh, that she's safe, she's taken care of, she doesn't have protesters who are lined up uh, berating her as she goes in and making sure that we're working with local governments, uh, making sure that we're working with uh, the new, uh, local police officers to make sure that, that doesn't happen. Uh, because anytime you go to the doctor, it's a stressful time, uh, particularly when, we're when you're making difficult decisions. And we want to make sure that everyone is comfortable and everyone has the access to make decisions that's best for them and their families. Great. Thank you. Thank you for uh, connecting it to healthcare. Um, access to abortion is just a part of normal healthcare. Um, so I think it's really important that we frame this conversation from that perspective. Um, so you, for your second question, and you, you have three minutes to talk about this, um, is do you support the use of chemical agents on protesters by law enforcement? Uh, absolutely no, I do not support the use of chemical agents uh, on protesters. Uh, like Representative Belk said, the right to peacefully protest to gather is what our country has been built on. Um, and I think that it's been very uh, shameful to see what's been going on across this country this year, particularly this summer, uh, in regards to using chemical agents, what we've seen here in our own city. Uh, I think that we need to look at how we're addressing uh, our justice system, how we're addressing our police officers from North Carolina perspective, uh, and taking a look at what kind of legislation we can do to ensure that people are not being harassed, they're not being um, attacked by the people who are supposed to serve and protect them in our communities. So I think a lot of that goes into making sure that we're having heightened training on what we can and cannot do for police officers and thinking about how that funding is being spent. Uh, I've had the opportunity to go on ride-alongs, and I'll tell you here in Charlotte, that we're down on police officers are, uh, are their staffing is down. So they're being stretched thin. So we have to make sure that we're able to provide them with the resources that they need to do their job. But we also should not be making them do jobs uh, that uh, they're not equipped for. And I think that we should make sure that we're not having them uh, using those chemical agents on peaceful protesters as they go around there just simply to protect property. Yes, absolutely. Thank you so much for that response. Um, and thank, thank you for joining us today. And I know it's your anniversary, so happy anniversary. And we'll let you get back to your wife and your celebration. Thank you, uh, thank you. Thank you for that. thank you for being here. Um, and I'm going to pass it. it I'm going to pass it over to uh, Christina um, to introduce our next candidate. Excellent. Thanks, Sarah. Wow, extra props for Terry Brown coming on his anniversary. That is such a treat. Um, I would like to introduce our next speaker, Representative Christy Clark. Thank you so much for joining us. All right, first question. Two minutes, you'll get a 30 second warning. What is the most pressing issue facing reproductive health today? Yeah, thank you everyone. Um, for those of you who don't know me, I represent the northern part of the county, Huntersville, Cornelius, and Davidson. Um, you know, the most pressing um, issue for reproductive health right now is, of course, a twofold thing. It's the Supreme Court. 
if we have a Supreme Court that is anti-choice, then we are in trouble and we cannot have that with good and let it happen quietly. But then the second issue related to that is our General Assembly. If we continue to have a Republican majority in Raleigh, then we are gonna to continue to have a General Assembly that is gonna put forward bills that are going to chip away at women's reproductive rights as, as they go. They will continue to get more and more extreme over time as they had in 2019 and will make it more dangerous for women um, as they go. And it's a lack, total lack of respect for women and their healthcare and their bodies. And so that's the, um, the most serious thing facing us right now. Agreed, both fronts, absolutely. All right, your next question, you have three minutes now. Uh, do you support the use of chemical agents on protesters by law enforcement? Yeah, thank you. And I'm going to echo what everyone else has said before me is absolutely not. You know, I don't support the use of chemical agents on anyone for any reason, and especially our protesters who are exercising their First and Fourth Amendment rights. Um, they should not have um, this kind of assault on them. And then, as we know, we don't truly know the, what the chemicals that are being used in those are having the impact on women of reproductive health or others who have other underlying conditions. And we also know that it's a, even more dangerous now because of COVID. It's impacting people's ability to breathe. And so it's exacerbating, the could, I guess, say, exacerbate the impact of COVID. And that's a terrible choice for us. And it's not how... We should be treating each other. We should be treating each other with respect and kindness and not using weapons of war that have since been banned in war on our citizens. It's very true. It's very true. I agree, of course. Um, <laughs> but, you know, we've seen a lot of protesting action take place uptown. Um, we've seen protests happen even around abortion clinics in Charlotte. Um, and it's it's been unfortunate to see that kind of behavior take place. Um, but, you know, I was curious to know, you know, your thoughts when it came to, to the right to protest and why that's so important. Because we mentioned it earlier with another um, legislator about how, you know, we experience these protests at abortion clinics as well um, here in Charlotte. And, you know, it feels like People are protesting over the rights that people have over their own bodily autonomy. And, you know, it's, it's kind of ironic to see that happening, but, you know, we agree that everyone should have the right. But how do you, where do you think that line is to where, you know, people are able to freely express their opinions, even if it's different or not in the mainstream, but how do we still allow people to, maintain autonomy. Is that a thing? Can we do that? Yeah, you know, when um, what's happening, of course, at our clinics in Charlotte is that the protesters are encroaching on individuals and their safety and their right to free access to health care. And so that's when, that's where you have to draw the line is when you're encroaching on someone else's rights, because you have the right um, to, to speak your mind, you have the right to assemble, that is part of our constitution, but you don't have the right to intervene between a woman and her health care. That is not not part of how we do things in this country and that's why Roe v. Wade exists. And so that's where I draw the line personally. Um, I do believe um, I have in my life participated in protests for various things, um, for gun violence, for um, Black Lives Matter, for the Women's March in DC. And so I recognize and understand the importance of those express, expressing the opinion of a group at large we should be in the, the importance of gathering together to express that. But I don't believe that the person protesting should be standing in the way of someone else's rights. Agreed. Thank you so much for sharing and for taking the time to be with us this evening. Good luck in your race. Thank you very much. I'm happy to be here. Thank you. I'm going to go ahead and pass it off to Taylor for our next speaker. Okay. Um, our next speaker will be um, Representative John Autry, who currently represents House District 100. Um, thank you for joining us. Um, my first question for you, which you'll have uh, two minutes to answer, is what do you think is the most pressing issue um, facing reproductive health care today? Well, besides the person who occupies the building at 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue and his uh, desire to pack this court with conservatives 
and that uh, he's made no bones about his ambitions to uh, drive back uh, and roll back Roe v. Wade. And uh, that, along with the <clears throat> current majority of the legislature, who uh, practically every other week is floating some concept of chipping away at more of the person's access to receive uh, uh, their care for their reproductive health. And uh, health care, reproductive health is health care. And uh, we shouldn't make any uh, qualms about that. And to uh, just like Representative Clark just mentioned, uh, when it comes to the folks out there who are uh, standing in front of those clinics, uh, I have some firsthand experience in that activity. Uh, my wife and I were clinic escorts for about a year and a half until uh, she was uh, really starting to show uh, signs of PTSD from the experience. So we had to draw back from that, but I continued to uh, support the community with uh, ding producing ding. videos and actually the uh, uh, videos that we use to uh, get the uh, injunction against Flip Benham was some of the work that I had uh, captured on camera myself. But I believe that abortion should be available to anybody on demand, no questions asked. Thank you. Thank you so much for your answer. And I will um, be able to follow up with you on that um, after our next question, because I think that you did highlight something that's really important, especially in Mecklenburg County, is um, the, um, the violence that is being out displayed outside of these abortion clinics. And um, I will definitely revisit that. Um, but my next question is, do you support the use of um, chemical agents on um, protesters by law enforcement? Um, we've seen a lot of that with some of the um, protests that have taken place all across the country and even here in uh, Mecklenburg County. So I won't need three minutes, so I'll just need three seconds. <laughs> no, I could stretch it out to five. <laughs> no, <laughs> but yeah, that, that's, that's excessive force and uh, is not conducive, especially when people are uh, exercising their constitutional rights to uh, go to their government with their, and express their grievances. And uh, I mean, the whole country is based on a protest. <laughs> I mean, protesting against the British crown is why we have the United States. So uh, no, uh, I, I, I don't agree with that. Uh, if, if they were to use those same agents on a battlefield, they would be guilty of a war crime. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. And I um, just to circle back to you, um, what you were mentioning earlier, I know um, it was discussed by one of our other um, candidates was just how um, we discussed the use of chemical agents towards um, protesters who are protesting um, systemic oppression and racism. Um, but those same um, tactics really aren't implied on um, protesters who are protesting outside of uh, clinics where people are looking to um, receive access to basic health care. Um, my question for you is just following up on that. Um, what do you think can be done in the state house, um, in the General Assembly, to protect um, access to abortion and some of the um, threats of violence at these clinics all across the state? So uh, women in North Carolina had access to abortion before Roe v. Wade. And uh, the uh, uh, what can we do? Elect a new majority. That's the first thing. Because uh, everything else is just a pipe dream unless you can count 61 votes in the House and, fit, and 26 in the Senate. And, and until that, and, and, and having a governor in, in the executive mansion who respects a woman's right, to that choice and access to that reproductive health, nothing. But we can do it. Definitely. Well, thank you so much for joining us. We appreciate you um, taking the time to speak with us tonight. And I um, will now pass it back to Sarah, who will introduce our next candidate. Thank you all very much. I appreciate it.
Thank you. Um, and thank you, Taylor. Um, so before we go to our next candidate, um, we are going to talk a little bit about how, why it's important to vote. Um, so we're having this candidate forum to figure out um, who's running on the ballot in Charlotte Mecklenburg um, and where they stand on issues that are important to us. Um, so voting in the election is really important. Um, you can already vote by mail. Um, a lot of people are, are voting right now, sending in their ballot. Um, early voting starts October 15th, and then the election is on November 3rd. So one of our partners is Vote Writers, and I'm gonna pass it over to Pam Pearson, who's gonna talk a little bit about um, their work around the election. Great, thanks, Sarah, and welcome, everybody. Uh, so Vote Writers is a national, nonpartisan, nonprofit organization. We focus just on voter ID. So you probably know a lot about other organizations like the League of Women Voters and uh, Blueprint and Democracy NC, all of which are great organizations that do a lot of work right on the ground, helping get people registered to vote and so forth. Um, our organization focuses just on ID. And just to be clear, the great thing in North Carolina right now is that no voter ID is required to vote in North Carolina. Um, that's not for lack of trying on the part of the General Assembly. Um, they passed a law just as they passed laws in over the course of the last decade, um, but it's been struck down both by the state and federal courts, or at least enjoined, so that for now, the only thing that is um, required is that you be a registered voter. And just like in the primaries in March, you can go in and vote in person, just saying your name and confirming your address when you go in. Um, but, uh, and of course we do have absent, absentee voting, no ID is required for that either. Although there's a weird quirk in North Carolina law, which currently only allows people who have a state driver's license or a state ID to vote absentee. You can't use the last four of your social like you can when you register to vote, and you can't use any other form of ID uh, to request your absentee ballot. It's a little strange. Um, a lot of the Board of Elections folks were surprised about it as well, and I'm hoping at some point um, that that will be changed so that it will be easier for um, everyone who wants to, to be able to request an absentee ballot. You know, this year we're very fortunate, like I said, um, come 2021 there will be, I'm sure because it's part of our Constitution, um, a requirement for some kind of photo ID. That's what's in the Constitution now. Um, there are lots of ways that the legislature can choose to make it easier for people who lack photo ID to still be able to vote. Um, and we'll see what they come up with. My organization doesn't do advocacy um, and we don't do litigation. So um, others will, I'm sure, take up that task. Um, but the most important thing to know is um, you don't need ID to vote this year. Um, my organization right now, and me in particular in the Charlotte area and across North Carolina, I'm focusing on helping people get ID who need it for other reasons. So I'm working with a lot of homeless folks who need ID to be able to get a job, to get housing. Um, and as you know from reading the paper, I mean, they're in really desperate straits these days and it's not getting any easier with the weather cooling down. Uh, so I work with them. Um, I work with a co coalition of groups that are helping returning citizens, former felons who have completed their parole or probation get their IDs so that they can um, get a jump start in rejoining society. Um, my personal view is that if our state says that's when you've served, you know, the, the court sentence that you've had has been served, then it, we should be doing everything we can to make it easier for these citizens to join us as voters. It's a really fundamental right. And I have to tell you, they're among the most gratifying people to work with because they're so excited to have that identification. They feel like it's almost like, like a badge of returning, um, like they're being recognized again. Um, so there's a lot of great work um, that we're doing across the country. And I said, my focus has been a little bit different in North Carolina this year. Um, and while next year would typically be a quieter year because there's not gonna be big elections on the horizon um, because of what will be going on in North Carolina. I think I'll probably be busier than ever and looking for a lot of volunteers to help me help people get ID. Because uh, it's not easy, uh, especially for folks in um, more difficult circumstances. So if you know of anybody who might need help um, or organizations who serve a population, um, please feel free to reach out to me. I'll put my contact information in the chat. Thanks, Sarah. 
Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much for uh, what you're doing. Really, really important work. Um, okay, so we are gonna keep moving. Um, we are on uh, the, our North Carolina State House segment. And so next up we have uh, Representative Nasif Majid, who's a Democrat who is running in District 99. Hello, yeah, uh, thank you, you for joining us today. Can you hear me okay? Yep. Oh, yes. So I have two questions for you. Um, the first question, and you have two minutes, is what is the most pressing issue facing reproductive health today? Okay. Let me try something else here. We can, we can hear you. We can hear you. Okay. Can you hear me better now? Can you hear me now? Okay, good, 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 good. Uh, okay, uh, as I say again, good evening. The, the, uh, I think the, uh, the most uh, pressing uh, uh, issue facing uh, uh, reproductive health is uh, the, 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 the situation we have upcoming up with the uh, Supreme Court nomination and Roe v. Wade. Uh, and them trying to, uh, the, the, the the far right trying to to um, to um, uh, I guess uh, overturn Roe v. Wade. Uh, you know, um, I, I'm a pro-choice uh, uh, person, and um, I, I, you know, I think we can't. I, I, this is a real pressing issue. I think uh, uh, um, the uh, Planned Parenthood. Um, especially uh, provides a lot of services for women. And uh, these are health, health services, uh, uh, pap smears, uh, 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 breast, scan, uh, uh, breast scans, uh, the scans uh, for, for cancer, um, and, and, and also in the rural areas, especially, and, and with, uh, especially in North Carolina, and I, 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 this year we want to get past the uh, ex Medicaid expansion, it affects rural areas. Uh, women's health care in rural areas, and that's, that's a very important. So uh, of the uh, plethora of services that, that Planned Parenthood provides, uh, you know, I, I think uh, it would be um, detrimental to the health in general for women. And, uh, but this uh, Roe v. Wade uh, situation come up in the courts, this is um, this is a fence pose. Absolutely, thank you, and thank you for um, talking about uh, rural areas. Um, as as you know, we have a lot of counties in North Carolina that don't even have an OBGYN, um, and it it's a critical critical issue. Um, and so, thank you for uplifting that. My next question for you, um, and you have three minutes, is: Do you support the use of chemical agents on protesters by law enforcement? Uh, uh, no, uh, I, I, I don't uh, subscribe to chemical uh, agents on protesters. Matter of fact, we were in a, uh, our delegation, we were in a meeting with uh, our mayor this evening, just before uh, this, uh, this uh, 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 meeting. And um, they, are, they, will, they are banning the use of those chemical agents uh, in, uh, in, for people who are protesting. Um, and, and, you know, it's coincidental, it's, it's coincidental that you mentioned that, that uh, we just uh, exited a meeting with them. So that's, for Charlotte, that is, that's the, that's, that, that would be the rule of law. Yeah, absolutely. And we've heard from um, several other candidates about that tonight as well. Um, and so I have a follow-up question for you. Um, we've been talking a lot about uh, protesting and how um, it's, a first, it's, it's a First Amendment right, and it's really important that we um, support um, our protesters, and but at the same time provide um, protection uh, for vulnerable spaces. And so, can you talk a little bit about how we see protesters in front of the clinics, um, and how, um, like, do you see the need to um, address protesting outside of healthcare clinics different than the need to address protests um, that are happening? Um, like in front of our government centers or in our streets um, around the Black Lives Matter movement. Um, are these issues that we should approach in the same way or do you think that they're different? Um, 
<clears throat> you know, we have the right to protest. That's that's the constitu constitutional right. Um, uh, but uh, I think uh, in the case of the, the, the clinics associated with parent, parent, parenthood, that people have um, uh, it's, uh, have uh, crossed the bounds. They 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 harass people and um, and uh, doctors and uh, some people have lost their life. I think that um, uh, and 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 sub at subsequent uh, to that, uh, we have laws now that they have to maintain spacing at those if they want to protest at those clinics. Uh, and and I'm hoping that that has uh, has. Um, help solve that problem as far as people being bodily injured and harassed or verbally harassed. Uh, as, as relates to Black Lives Matter, uh, certainly um, uh, the injustice uh, that has uh, 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 pervaded our, uh, uh, our, our nation as far as racial justice is concerned, uh, uh, and some, the way some of these cases have been going down, uh, <clears throat> people have to protest uh, because uh, of the, the injustice that are going on. Uh, and uh, to, uh, to to change that scenario, uh, where it will be equal justice for all, um, uh, you know. So I I, I believe in that uh, 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 constitutional right to protest, uh, I, and I, but I don't subscribe to people uh, the violence that, that some people have uh, have exhibited. But uh, certainly the right to protest and 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 to be heard to change the scenario uh, is well founded. Absolutely. Thank you for that great answer. Um, and you you brought up how we've had doctors and individuals that have been um, injured and some have been killed um, due to protests in front of um, clinics. And I think that that's really important for us to highlight um, because clinics in the South have a really hard time obtaining doctors to come and perform um, abortion care for, for patients. A lot of times we will have doctors that travel from Seattle and all over the country because it, it can be dangerous for doctors who do perform ab abortions to live in the South um, because of the environment that's here. Um, so thank you very much for um, your answers today and for uplifting that and for joining us today. Thank you. I'm going to pass it over to uh, Chris. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Kelly. Excellent. Thank you. We're going to kick it off to our next speaker, Representative Becky Carney. Thank you so much for joining us this evening. Um, we'll go ahead and I'll give you, I guess we have, we have a little bit of extra time. I'll give you a minute to introduce yourself. I know you've been sitting here patiently. Um, go ahead and share share anything you'd like to share before we get to our first question. Wow, well, thank you. Um, um, I'm, I'm just thrilled to be here tonight with all the women that are listening in and that are being proactive. I am uh, running for my 10th um, term in the legislature and people say, why, are you, why do you keep going back? Why do you keep going? Because every time at the end of a term, I look back and say, didn't get that accomplished. And I have been there through the horrible impacts that have been made in the state on, on women's reproductive rights. I have been there and sat through and voted against every horrific bill that came forward. But you always say, you know, keep going because you're gonna make a difference if you keep pounding. So I'm really proud to uh, have um, been um, endorsed by so many women's rights groups. Um, it's something that I, I wear as a badge of honor when, whenever I'm out uh, within my communities and, and in the state. Uh, so I'm a proud mom of six grown children and 14 grandchildren and one new uh, great grandbaby, which she's almost two. And um, I, I fight for what I do because of them. So if you want me to keep talking, I could tell you a whole lot more. <laughs> no, we'll get, in, we'll get into our questions. You're clearly very busy and have a very full life. Um, that's really great to hear about all of the children and the grandchildren and the great grandchild. That's such a gift. Yeah. Um, our first question for you is, what do you think is the role, no, what is the most important pressing issue 
facing reproductive health today? Well, I'm going to say just access, access, access. And that's in, in many forms, access to health care, access to Medicaid expansion. I think about what I have always been, uh, that's been one of my top priorities since it came before us in the legislature and we just don't address it. And it's one of those issues that is the kind of public policy that everybody, no matter what your political affiliation is, that everybody should be able to get around that. And I keep telling people and I keep asking the majority in Raleigh, why? Why? Why not? Why are we not doing it? And there's never a reason, but we know from the underlying. Um, and, and also in, with expansion of Medicaid, we expand the economy, we um, close the gap. And also one of the issues that uh, people don't really get is that it can reduce infant mortality. And North Carolina is the 13th, I think that's the right number, 13th highest infant mortality rate in the nation. 13th, that's not right. Um, we have um, um, a lot of unintended pregnancies um, and, and there are more and, and we, have to, we have to know this and that is that black women are, are three to four times ding, ding. more um, uh, expected to die from unrelated complications from a pregnancy. I just, you know, I think that's so important. I think it's from what the groups that are represented in, in your group tonight, your network, we've got to start talking about if you want to, and I'm going over my time, so I'll slip into my three minute on the other one. Um, but I just think it's important that we as policymakers, we need to start, and women need to start having the conversation about it's time to talk about reproductive health care as primary care. And we don't talk about that enough. And it's so impacting in so many ways. I also think that, and I've been, I've had bills uh, filed to um, expand contraception and access to contraception to all. And it needs to be offered in our schools at the, at the high school level. We have to talk about that. So I, mean, I have other things I want to say on that, and someday we need to just have a, a full conversation on the expansion of Medicaid and why it's so important and how the tentacles of expanding Medicaid, 700,000 plus people, and in this pandemic time, it is critical that we do that. So most important issue to me, Medicaid expansion with long tentacles to uh, women's reproductive health and also to voting turning back our majority in Raleigh. It's so important. And of course, the, the Supreme Court, which I, th I don't know if we can stop that, but we have to be aware and let people know what is coming ahead of us. So yes. I just wanted to say that. Women, equity, and access to care and reproductive health care. Mm -hmm. And I think with Medicaid expansion, we think it's super important and it's something that impacts people, not just women, it impacts everyone. Right. Um, but it definitely has a direct impact to reproductive health and freedom in so many different ways. Um, <clears throat> do you think we have time to squeeze in this Facebook question? Can we go ahead and do that? All right, we have a question come in on Facebook. It says, as a clinic defender and escort, I would appreciate you continuing to ask the candidate's opinion about their ideas concerning the anti-protesters that are at the health facilities daily. So what are your thoughts on, on that? We were talking about earlier how there have been some protests happening around abortion clinics here in Charlotte, um, and I'm sure it happens across the country, but we wanted to know about your thoughts surrounding that. Well, I, I mean, again, back to what everybody's been saying, peaceful protesting is a constitutional right. But in my family, we have had an experience with that firsthand of approaching uh, um, an abortion clinic and having the horrific shouting, the, the condescending comments. Um, and it's not on the property. We know that it's the surrounding property. Um, but I look at this as 
this is, uh, these clinics, again, I go back to the word access. That's access for women, for whatever their reason for being there, that's access to healthcare. Now, do we see protesting, condescending comments, uh, yelling, screaming, whatever, um, around other healthcare facilities? No. So again, we've got to talk about women's health care, reproductive health as primary care. And when we start having those, those discussions and we educate the public more and more and more, then I think we can start to see some of this uh, backing off a little. Mm. Let's hope so. Let's yeah. hope so. All right, your final question. You have three minutes for this one. Um, what do you support the use of chemical agents on protesters by law enforcement? No, <laughs> I do not. And and I do want I want to and I've, I've I've been on here for since the state members uh, mm -hmm. rep representatives have been answering these questions. And I agree. I you know I, I agree that. Um, uh, we have all been, we've been in that meeting today, as you've heard, uh, with the, the mayor, and uh, we were all in a meeting with um, the, the chief, uh, deputy chief at the time back in June, when the, the first uh, protesting happened uptown, and we, we came together as a delegation and met with um, the city leaders and to discuss the this use of the chemical, um, the chemicals that can harm people. So I do agree with what the, the chief had um, today has come out, the city has come out and uh, no tear gas will be used. I'm glad that they did do the no knock warrants. They've eliminated that. That's a good thing moving forward. Um, but I wanna point out that one of the things I'm proud of is over my years in Raleigh, our delegation, our Mecklenburg delegation has always worked closely together on issues that address, that are in pre, um, prevalent in our city. And uh, this issue, uh, when this started um, back in the, the spring in June, when it all hit and the discussion started, we've all been talking about it and uh, what needs to be done. And, and I don't know that you would find a single delegation member that um, would support uh, chemicals being used in, in protesting and on protesters. And again, for peaceful protesters, constitutional right. But when it becomes violent, that's where, you know, we have to be careful that we don't cross the line, but I'm totally I'm in support. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for sharing and thank you so much for bringing up one of my favorite issues, Medicaid expansion. I think that's so important. Um, thank you for, for being here and being so generous with your time. We really appreciate it. Thank I'm you for having us. Thank you for having us. It's very important that we all have a chance to be heard with the people in our community that we serve, and I appreciate it. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. I'm going to go ahead and pass it off to Taylor. Thanks, Christina. Um, I will just introduce our next um, candidate. We will have um, Representative Carolyn Logan, who is representing House District 101. Um, and I will just allow you a minute to introduce yourself as well. And then we'll hop into our first question. Hi, I don't know why my video, my video is not working. No, not, um, we can't see you right now. You can't? No, not yet. I've clicked on it. I don't know why it's telling me it, it can't start. Let's see. Because hmm. I was... I was messing with the whole time sitting here while Representative Carney was talking and it's saying that it's some type of failure to start. Mm. Sarah, are you able to- I ask, thought you had control of it. Oh, um, well, are, Sarah, are you able to ask her to start the video? If not, I guess we can just ask the question if it doesn't work. Um, but yep, if, um, 
Yeah, Representative Logan, <clears throat> I'm sending you a prompt to start your video. Um, so hopefully something just pops up and you can click, you can okay it. And if, if not, it's okay, um, we can just continue. We're, we're happy to have you here um, and we all have technical difficulties sometimes. <laughs> Yeah. Well, then I think we can just go ahead and I will just, Okay. you can go ahead and uh, introduce yourself. And then um, after that, I will ask you the first question. Thank you. Okay. Good evening. I'm a representative, Carolyn Logan. She said um, the House of Representatives representing uh, District 101. Um, I am running for my second term in the House. I've lived in Charlotte for over 35 years. I'm the mother of three grown children, uh, two daughters and one son. I'm a graduate of Belmont Abbey College. Uh, I've uh, served in law enforcement. I'm North Carolina's first black female state trooper. I um, served in law enforcement for a little over 30 years and did all my time in North Carolina. Uh, well, of course, in North Carolina, right here in Mecklenburg. So I'm used to serving the people of this great state. Uh, of course, I've uh, in serving and being the first uh, female, especially black female, to do that. I've uh, have experienced discrimination. I had to change policies. I know what it's like, you know, especially being a first black female and female in that type of work. I had to change policies. I was the uh, first woman to ever have children in a job, in that job. And so I had to have right policies where a female would be comfortable to be, even have children. So I had to, uh, you know, live through it. And it wasn't easy. To, so everything I did was the first time, uh, you know, designing a uniform for women to wear it so it would fit right was pretty much the first time. So my job is to, of course, to represent the people of this state and to fight for women, because even at my age, I still come upon struggles. And I plan to continue to fight because my daughters are starting to experience troubles now in their jobs. And they're starting to see what I was coming home, trying not to bring home to them but it has come home now and I have to fight for women of all colors to make things better. And that's what I plan to do until I cannot do it anymore. Hmm. Yeah, thank you. Um, thank you for sharing your experiences and your motivations for running. Um, I think that those are really important issues that you highlighted in terms of representation. Um, I, my first question for you, um, which you'll have um, two minutes for, is um, what is the most pressing issue facing um, reproductive health care today? I think uh, one of the issues of, I feel is that women not being able to do what they want to do with their own bodies. Uh, not only they have to deal with what other women are telling them to do, what their male counterparts are telling them to do, what society is telling them what to do. They need to be able to do what they feel is right for themselves and be comfortable what decisions they make for themselves. And I think that's one of the biggest challenges that we have now. And then uh, what monies need to be in place of when they make these decisions so that they could be comfortable and able to afford what you know they want to do and be able to, like I say, afford what they have decided to do and, and be able to handle whatever choices that they make. Thank you. Um, yes, I think that um, bodily autonomy is really important and I'm glad that that is a priority for you as well. Um, our next question, um, it is regarding um, the use of chemical agents towards protesters. So um, do you support the use of um, these chemical agents that ha we've seen um, being used against um, protesters um, by law enforcement? I do not support the use of chemical agents on uh, 
peaceful protesters. They, under the First Amendment, it talks about uh, peaceful protesters. And so if a pro protesters are peaceful, <coughs> excuse me, there's no reason for any type of, you know, combat against them, any type of repercussions. So, and that the, I think we need to educate the public and to let them know that that's in no time should that be used. And, you know, everybody talks about the First Amendment. You have to understand what it says. It talks about uh, a peaceful assembly. And the First Amendment also talks about if it's unlawful. And with everything you do in life, if you do something the total opposite, we always heard, you know, what I like, I tell my children, you, you reap what you sow. So then if it turns unlawful, then there'd be maybe some other consequences to that other side. But pr protesting to me is a lawful assembly and there should be no chemical agents used on peaceful protesters. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, thank you for taking that stance um, and sharing that with us. Um, I did want to follow up. I know that um, some of our candidates have um, addressed some of the concerns that anti-choice um, pro regarding um, anti-choice protesters and their presence at um, reproductive health care facilities um, who provide abortion services across Mecklenburg County um, and just the concerns around um, their presence and protecting um, patients' ability to access this care. Um, can you speak to this issue and um, why or and if you feel like it is important um, to address that concern? It is important to address it because we're getting back on to the same thing. They're blocking people who have a right to go to the facility. You know, first of all, they have a right to be there. Of course, the, we go back, they have a right to a peaceful assembly. They do not have a right to scream uh, and call them names. Again, you know, when I talked about, it talks about unlawful things. You don't have a right to use fighting words. Uh, or do anything unlawful or illegal to anyone. So when people, like I say, if they get there and they haul up First Amendment rights, you have to actually really know the, the, your First Amendment when you're talking about that. Know exactly what you're saying and what it says and what it doesn't say. So they don't have a right to touch these people, yell, you know, insulting words to them, touch them or anything like that. So we need to find a, I guess you, you guess a happy median is a way to put it, but so they can be out there and feel like they're getting to say what they need to say. They get doing their protesting and the people go where they need to go because they have a right to be there. You say, well, both sides have a right to be there, but they can't be harassing these people for going where they have a, a lawful reason to be there. So that may be something that we need to take up. Um, uh, hopefully that we get it to be in, to have the a majority to where we can start looking at the right laws that are really gonna benefit the people and make it safer for people because things are really getting out of control. And we do need to get a handle and right laws it's going to really make it safer for people to be able to go places where they are supposed to be and not be harassed, you know, with uh, groups uh, like that. Yeah, um, absolutely. I think that uh, I'm glad that you expressed that um, because I think that um, having a state law to protect those patients, I feel like that would make a, um, a huge difference, especially um, seeing patients still um, facing those protesters even during a global pandemic. Um, so thank you for expressing that. And um, okay, there is a, a Facebook question um, and I can just ask you this as well. Um, could someone define um, peaceful? Because that seems to be something that is um, brought up consistently. So um, 
I know, I'm not sure if you mentioned it specifically, but um, during our conversations, um, some of the candidates have mentioned uh, peaceful protests. So um, what is your definition of um, peaceful protests versus um, other forms of protest? If you could elaborate on that a little more, um, that would be helpful for us. Okay. Um, well, you say a peaceful is just out there stating your cause. Okay, you marching or walking, you know, you have your signs, you're just voicing while you're out there. You know, you're in, you're out, you're walking down the street, you it's not disruptive, you're not destroying property. I looked it up. The First Amendment is talking about illegal conduct. You're not um, inciting or imminent unlawful actions. Um, you're not inciting violence, you're writing words, uh, you're not hitting, destroying property. You know, that's anything, when you go into that, that's not peaceful. You know, is that making sense? You're not causing injury to people. Mm -hmm. When you go to things like that, that's not peaceful. So peaceful is that you're not causing harm or injury to anyone else. You just out there demonstrating what your cause is. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yes. Well, thank you for clarifying um, what you um, were expressing in your statement. And thank you for answering the questions that we've um, had for you tonight and being willing to join us this evening. Um, we appreciate you taking the time. And I will pass it back to um, Sarah, who will um, present our, um, our next candidate for the night. Great, thank you, Taylor, um, and thank you, Representative Logan. Uh, so we have three candidates left, um, and so we are going to just go right to the next candidate. Um, so hopefully we can get done um, around 8.30. Um, so our next candidate is uh, Representative Rachel Hunt, who's a Democrat running in District 103. Um, and I'm excited to talk to you because you are my representative. I live in your district. So thank you for being here with us tonight. Thank you. I am so happy to be here. I'm so thrilled to see my friend Pam Pearson. We were on the Lillian's List board together. As some, most of you should know, Lillian's List is the board that supports um, reproductive health rights, women running for office. So that is very important for what y'all are trying to do. I just want you all to know that I have served as a clinic escort. I have served as a person who took students, actually, children, 14 year old girls in front of judges in South Carolina in the early 90s to get judicial bypasses when that law was enacted there. One that especially stands out in my mind was a victim of rape by her father. And I will never, ever forget that experience as long as I live. I picked her up at an, a place, safe place away from her home. I took her to get the judicial bypass. I took her to Planned Parenthood to get the abortion. And um, the story that she told to me and to the judge, who was, who was not sympathetic at all, let me add, um, was heartbreaking. And she was just one of thousands of people all over the country that have had to go through that. So I know exactly what you all are doing here and I completely sympathize, and it is a fight that should have been over by now. We all thought that we were on a different level in the late 90s, that we weren't gonna go back. And now, with, with the Supreme Court decision and the new Supreme Court justice, who I'm sure is gonna get um, certified, I am terrified, as I'm sure you all are, about what's gonna happen. And so what we think, is that probably um, it's gonna get kicked back to the states. And so that is gonna make the people that serve on the state legislatures even more important. And as I'm sure you all know, most of the people that we all are running against, my opponent especially in Christie's, are very right-wing anti-choice people. And if we let our state go back to that, then we have no hope of coming out of this with the Supreme Court situation the way it is. So I want you to know that I have been a worker in this fight my entire life. Um, I was a Planned Parenthood um, person that went to Planned Parenthood. My daughter's gone to Planned Parenthood, 
but I have been on the front lines just as you all are. So I know how important this is. It is vital. There is nothing more important than a woman's right to control her body. And the most important part of that is when to and to not have children. So I'm with you all the way. Thank you. Thank you so much. I didn't know that part of your story. Um, and so thank you for your work um, of clinic escorting and helping with judicial bypass. Um, that is part of the work that CRAN does. Um, so we also drive, um, you know, we work with a woman's choice and the ACLU to, to get access for minors as well. And it is so important. So I, I appreciate you so much more representative. Um, thank, you. thank you for sharing that. Sure. Um, okay, so I'm going to go to your first question. Yes. Um, you have two minutes. Um, what do you think is the most pressing issue facing reproductive health today? So I've already touched on this a little bit, and that is what's going to happen with the Supreme Court. Um, if there is a 6-3 conservative, not, you know, anti-choice majority on the Supreme Court, we all know that um, Roe v. Wade may be you know, eliminated. They may vote against it. They may get rid of it. And then it would go back to the, the states and the state legislatures would decide. It would be on a state-by-state -state basis. There would be many states that would not have any access to abortion at all. As we all know, there are several now that only have one abortion clinic in the entire state. So the access for women who are not wealthy is the same as none. That is the same as denying a, a healthcare right to people that they need to have to live successfully. There is almost nothing worse than that. So here in North Carolina, if we can get a majority of Democrats in the House or and or, we'd love to have both, the Senate, think of the things we could pass. I've heard my friends talk about Medicaid expansion. That would be the number one thing. That would fill in the gap for people who are not able to have health care insurance right now. But we could also get rid of these horrible laws. Now, we have stopped the very worst ones by uh, sustaining the governor's vetoes this past summer. You all know, okay. I'm sure you've heard tonight, that we had to sit there and we actually had to stand up for the born alive survivor, a real person that they brought in. So. Um, we know there's a whole line of the way they go. It's, you know, making sure that people get between women and the doctors, making sure that, um, that women are not allowed to have, that have to wait two or three days. So you have to, you know, there's no way if you have to travel two days to get to a place that you're able to do it and to not cover it with insurance. I mean, there's the entire line of things that have happened and that will continue but we can get rid of that if we could get the majority. That's absolutely. Cool. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you very much um, for that great answer. Uh, so your next question, and you have three minutes to answer this question, is do you support the use of chemical agents on protesters by law enforcement? Uh, no, I do not. And you, I think Becky Carney, my friend, Representative Carney, said earlier that we heard some good news tonight from our chief of police that they have stopped using tear gas here in Charlotte. Um, we would like that to happen statewide, actually all over the nation, um, and they've stopped the no-knock warrants, which is a huge issue as well. So I don't see any reason to be to use those things um, if you know if people are being peaceful. I know you ask how how we know whether people are being peaceful earlier. Now, let's talk for a second about what the protesters at the abortion clinics are like. I just went on the National Abortion Federation website and pulled the North Carolina statutes. So we've got three things here. One is an injunction because Kaplan versus Pro-Life Action League, they, the anti-abortion extremist picketed a dozen times outside the doctor's home, threatened his life, and attempted to coerce him to stop providing abortions. So that was a case, and there were provisions to stop them from doing that anywhere near his home or threatening or communicating threats or confronting him at his house. So that's one. The second one is a facility ordinance, which was in effect to, to they were blocking people's access to and egress from a healthcare facility. We know that's what they do. That's what they do all the time. 
So that was ruled um, unlawful. So they could also not injure or threaten to injure a person trying to get health care services. And the last one was a picketing ordinance in front of, before, or about the residence or dwelling of another doctor, and that one was in 2010. So there have been three cases where we've, uh, we've been able to do something. Now, I know they've also been able to do some things about the noise level here in Charlotte because they use all of these, you know, horns that make things very loud and completely disturb the neighborhood. Uh, these people are there to do one thing, and that is to threaten and to scare and to coerce people away from getting their legally recognized healthcare rights. And so anytime we can mm -hmm. get them on, um, on, on breaking any ordinance, or we need to do that. So we need to be very careful to watch what they are doing and to make sure that they are not breaking any law, city, state, or federal. And if they are, we've got to call them on. Absolutely. Um, I love your energy and I also love how knowledgeable you are on this issue. Um, so thank you so much for um, your representation and, and all the hard work that you're doing for us in Raleigh. And thank, thank you for you being so here tonight. Thank you all. Absolutely. Um, okay, so we have two candidates left. I'm going to pass it over to Christina who will introduce our next candidate. Yes, Sarah, I agree. I love Rachel's energy. Thank you. Um, our next speaker will be Brandon Lofton. Uh, thank you so much, Brandon, for, for joining us this evening. <clears throat> I will start you off with the first question. You'll have two minutes and you'll get a 30 second um, warning. So what is the most pressing issue facing reproductive health today? Well, first, uh, thank you guys for having us and putting this together and thank you uh, for having me. Um, I also, of course, I, I have to, um, well, I have to acknowledge uh, my disadvantage coming after Rachel, um, but I will, uh, I will thank you guys anyway for, for, for the opportunity. Um, so I'm Brandon Lofton, I represent District 104, and I think, you know, what you've already heard is exactly right. I mean, I think we all know um, that what may happen with the Supreme Court will shift the front lines uh, to protecting reproductive health and women's autonomy um, to North Carolina, to the state level. And so we've already, my colleagues and I, we've already been through this fight uh, in our very first session last year um, with one of these bills. And we already know what that fight has been like. And so we're fully prepared and ready to continue that fight next time um, because it's gonna be all the more important if we lose the Supreme Court. So absolutely, the number one priority is making sure uh, that we can continue that fight at the state level. And frankly, that's going to require making sure we have the right people there in the legislature. Excellent. Excellent. So true. So true. All right. So we have more time with this next question. All right. Um, and, you know, feel free to answer how you would like. If it could be within your purview, you can just express your feelings. Um, but do you support the use of chemical agents on protesters? by law enforcement? I do not support the use of chemical agents um, on, on peaceful protesters. I think, again, you've heard, uh, we just had a call with, um, with Chief Jennings earlier today, um, and we spoke with him about this, and, and he has informed us that they have changed uh, their policy with respect to crowd control, and they will not use um, tear gas on peaceful protesters. Uh, I think you've already heard from my colleague, Carolyn Logan, about kind of what constitutes a uh, peaceful protest. Um, and I think that that's critical. Our citizens obviously should have the right to exercise uh, their right of free speech uh, as long as they're not infringing on other people's rights or causing harm. And so I think that's an important, um, that's an important distinction uh, to make. And I think that they, we should all rest um, in the knowledge and, 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 and protection uh, to know that our police are not going to use chemical agents on us simply for trying to exercise our constitutional right to free speech. Mm, excellent. Um, I, I know other, other speakers had the opportunity to share, but I'd love for you if you could quickly, in 30 seconds or less, 
um, quickly share your thoughts on, on the protests that are happening around abortion clinics, because that's something that's very relevant in Charlotte, and we'd love to hear um, your thoughts on what can be done around that. Yeah, it's, it's, it's absolutely um, disturbing and unacceptable um, for anyone to try to intimidate or prevent someone from exercising uh, their rights. Um, it's, it's completely unacceptable, and we need to do everything we can to protect um, women who are going in to exercise their rights and for control over their own reproductive health. Uh, no one has the right to interfere with that. And even though people do have the right to free speech, we need to make sure we protect people's rights to exercise their uh, constitutional rights to have control over their own bodies. And so we need to look at, um, as Representative Hunt pointed out, uh, ordinances and other things to make sure uh, that we prevent that kind of intimidation, frankly, um, which it's all it is, is intimidation and threats um, that we prevent that from happening. Excellent answer. Thank you so much. Brandon, for joining us and for being here tonight and for sharing. Uh, we're gonna pass it off to Taylor for our final speaker. Thank you, Christina. Um, I will introduce our representative, Wesley Harris, who represents House District 105. Um, you will be our last candidate of the night. Um, thank you for being patient and joining us and closing us out. Um, my first question for you is just, um, what is the most pressing issue facing reproductive health care today? Uh, yeah, absolutely. Thank, thank you all for, for inviting me. Uh, thank you for letting me be here. Um, I am honored to be the, the final person in my esteemed, uh, esteemed delegation to, uh, to, to go. We have, a, we have a great unit up, at, up in Raleigh, and so I'm glad, glad to be a part of them. But uh, the, the biggest threat to reproductive health is the, um, is, is the assault that we're seeing on abortion rights and pretty much the assault that we're seeing on, on family planning in general. Um, it is one of it as as Representative Carney said. It is um, it is basic health care. It is it is universal health care that we need to have people um, have people to have. Uh, it it is imperative we we protect this right, this constitutional right of people. And as as we're seeing with the Supreme Court, uh, that is more likely than not going to become a six three very conservative Supreme Court. Uh, that is going to go back to the states, and so it is going to be even more important that we protect that right, uh, that right to have abortion in North Carolina um, and make sure that people have that right. Because again, the choice to choose when, when you have a family and is, is paramount to everything, uh, everything in everyone's lives. It's important to making sure you get the education that you need, that you have the economic opportunities that you need. And it, it helps society in, in general of just trying to reduce the sheer number of unwanted pregnancies. And if we, do what we're supposed to, and we invest in these uh, in these healthcare needs. We can actually reduce the number of abortions, which I think everyone can agree that is what we okay. want to do. Um, and, and so that is that is the biggest threat that we're that we're facing now, just the sheer assault on family planning and reproductive health in general. And it's something that I'm committed to to fighting for as long as I am in the uh, in the state legislature. Perfect. Yes, thank you. Um, I think that you hit on some really important um, points. And I know that um, my next question is um, a little bit different, but it is really important as well. Um, do you support the use of um, chemical agents on protesters um, by law enforcement um, at social justice um, protests? I, I do not. Uh, I, I fully agree with, with my other colleagues. Uh, there is no place for, for chemical chemical agents to be used on, on protesters. And again, we, we keep throwing out the word peaceful protesters, but uh, protesting is, is peaceful. Uh, that is, is a constitutional right that we have. Um, and there is no, no circumstance in any situation that chemical agents should be used on protesters. Um, again, if they become non, uh, non-legal uh, demonstrations, then that, that's a story. And ideally we wouldn't have to use chemical agents on them then, but there are there are ways that we we can approach that. But yeah, just simple exercising of your first First Amendment rights to protest. There is there's no need um, for any chemical agents to be used in crowd control. And I'm I'm glad that our that our city has has taken the taken the steps to to prevent that from happening again. Mm -hmm. 
Thank you. And um, I just, my last question will just allow you to also respond um, to some of the protests that we've seen um, that have also actually ramped up during the pandemic at um, some of these um, abortion clinics that we have in Mecklenburg County. Um, so if you could just respond to that, um, and then that will be our last um, remark for the night. Absolutely. And so when we're dealing with these protests at um, abortion clinics and Planned Parenthood, it's it's really an entirely different different beast altogether than what we're seeing again with the Black Lives Movement and what we saw in, in Uptown Charlotte. Because again, one of those protests is they're fighting injustice. You know that they are fighting injustice for their lives and standing up for for their for their right to right to live. And then in the um, in the case of the abortion clinics and the protests, they are trying to prevent people from exercising their their constitutional rights. And so it's an entirely different animal. Um, it's like when, when we talk about freedom, it's the freedom of your fist ends where my face starts and your freedom of speech stops when you're prohibiting other people from exercising their freedoms. Um, and that is the th that is the way we have to look at these things. And when we're trying to legislate and prevent these things, it's 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 one of those things. Again, in normal circumstances, threats uh, threats are not are, are not allowable. You know that those are illegal. You can you can go to the police for that. And it is the exact same thing when you're trying to intimidate people trying to get basic medical care. Um, and and again, I, I agree with the ordinances that we're trying to do to prevent them from getting as close as they can. And it is something we absolutely have to stop because it's entirely uncalled for. Hmm. Okay. Perfect. Well, thank you. Um, thank you for expressing those concerns and then just um, sharing all of your um, your top priorities with us tonight. Um, I will pass it back to Sarah um, to close us out um, for the evening. Thank you, Taylor, um, and thank you, Representative Harris. Big thank you to all of our candidates. Um, I am blown away. Uh, this was such a great event. I'm just really honored that you all spent some time with us today. Uh, we know that you're so busy. It's election season. You're also um, in Raleigh doing, doing a lot of work on our behalf. So thank you so much for being here today. Um, just a couple uh, things to close out. Uh, Cran has our nonpartisan voter guide um, that is on our Facebook page. So please um, access that um, before you go to the polls. Um, please vote, please, please, please vote. Uh, early voting starts October 15th. Election day is November 3rd. Um, if you aren't registered to vote, you can go to Mecklenburg Board of Elections. You can register online. You can request an absentee ballot. Um, just please make a plan to vote. Um, please access our voter guide um, to help you make responsible decisions while you're voting. Uh, we also have some great events coming up. Um, tomorrow, we're gonna do a phone bank um, with the North Carolina AIDS Action Network and Planned Parenthood to focus on calling our, supporter, our supporters and asking them to contact their senators to delay a nomination for the Supreme Court until after the election. We also have a great event coming up Tuesday night um, with a sister song in um, the ACLU of North Carolina. Um, we are going to screen Belly of the Beast, which talks about forced sterilizations that are happening um, or that have happened in uh, Car Car California women prisons. Um, this is very timely with um, news coming out of Georgia about forced sterilizations that are happening at ICE detention centers. Um, so as we all know that protecting access to abortion is also about protecting access to have a child um, because it's about bodily autonomy first and foremost. Um, so that event starts at six o'clock um, and we hope that you'll join us um, then as well. Um, but that is it. Thank you so much for joining us today and I hope you all stay safe and well. Have a good rest of your night.